Hello. Good morning. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Elden Dogs, a very special Elden Dogs. This is Elden Dogs number 25. Hey. 25. It feels Mid. like there have been a lot more. And you've only been here for some. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't recognize that voice, it's because he hasn't been here in a while. We had to pull out the biggest of guns for this episode. Mm-hmm. Because only one of us knows a shitload about Dark Souls. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's me. <laughs> uh, I am Sir Gideon Offnir. Uh, we have survived the the whole war, and now we're in the end game. We're talking about our creators today. Um, not the Golden Order, not um, the God of Rot, none of the other weirdos. We're talking about the great Miyazaki and Martin. Who else is here? Uh, Alexander Iron Fist here, still all band-aided and taped up um, from my personal shattering. Um, <laughs> but I'm doing good. I have some people leaking out of me at the moment, but I'll I will, be just fine. I will say, this is the least hungover you've looked in a while. I need to take better care of myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't drink that much last night. Okay. See, the problem is you're in Wisconsin, so you're eating alcoholics it's, as Alexander. Now yeah. you're just full yeah. of alcoholics inside. So it didn't yeah. matter. I mean, the human body is made of like 90% water, 10% other stuff, and 100% high life. <laughs> yeah, that, that's yeah, it. That's don't do the math. I did the math for you. And I'm like the cool secret character you guys totally missed. I'm Dylan. You're cut content. I'm cut content, baby. <laughs> I'm a cool boss, but guess what? It was just too weird for people. People couldn't handle it. No, people just couldn't handle it. Uh, yeah, I'm actually excited to talk about uh, a few creators here. There's nothing I like better than talking about the art itself. So, As, as a as a young man, well, we're part of the Tokyo Beat Podcast Network. Check them out. Um, as a young man, I remember in English class, you'd have the about the author page and they'd make us read it. I'm like, this is the most stupid thing ever. I don't need to know about these guys. I hate this. And then, you know, growing up, you realize it's actually super informative to know yeah. the time period, who they were and why they wrote the things that they did. Right. Yeah. So I thought it'd be fun today. We do this series on the main uh, dog cast, uh, Raw Dogs specifically where we do great gamers in history. Uh, Nolan Bushnell was a banger of an episode. That one was fun. The Tetris episode was great. I, I, I mostly wanted... just talked about Chuck E. Cheese, but, you know. We just needed an excuse to talk about Chuck E. Cheese, which uh, is why. I, I really did. It's kind of like when we did the McDonald's episode. And, yeah, I mean, and this is a little bit of an excuse for me to talk about A Song of Ice and Fire today as well. Uh, yeah, we're talking about our lord and creators, our saviors, Hidetaka Miyazaki and George R. R. Martin. Mm-hmm. We're going to start with... Uh, the big cheese, Hidetaka Miyazaki. Um, he was born 1974 in nice. Shizuoka, Japan. He's relatively young. Yeah, it's... Uh, He's almost 50, that means. He never likes to talk about his personal life. So I had to uh, it's follow, just, follow him to his house. Yeah, I actually hired a private eye. Mm-hmm. His name was Dylan. Yeah. I, I went all I flew hey you you footed the bill, man. I went all the way to Japan. You used to be a private eye briefly. I think I've done like that, I've done like four cases, I guess is what you could call them. Your business card said I'm a real dick. <laughs> I didn't have a business card because that would leave traces of evidence. <laughs> the, the, the amount of Souls games that you've played, even if Brad paid you, I think for you, Dylan, that would still be stalking. <laughs> oh yeah i mean yeah it's i i the, i'm famous for saying dark souls is still probably my favorite game of all time uh it was a time in my life i i fell in love with it it felt like something brand new i i had even played demon souls and i think demon souls is just okay dark souls kicked that up to the next level just automatically it was it was love at first sight yep you, love at first controller you're the first soul. You're the you're the you're the soul of the podcast. Yeah, it's true. I'm kind of like the Holy Trinity. Sometimes I'm kind of you're I'm kind like of the Holy thing. I'm the Holy Ghost of the Trinity. I'm kind of there, watching down on you. But we, I'm we like the spirit around you. I'm the force. We are one, but three. It's hard to understand. Yes, yep. exactly. And I'm also half woman. Uh, that's my America side. But and I oh, sometimes man. moonlight as a giant turtle who likes to wear a pulp hat. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> That's huge. Wow. You just do that anyway. But it was, it's, well, first we opened a beer. We're having a special beer for Elden Dogs 25. 
We got a Bourbon County from Goose Island. Uh, stout aged in bourbon barrels with coffee added. Wow. This Where'd is you get 20, that from? Probably seagulls. <laughs> um, people go crazy when Bourbon County's out. At least it used to be a bigger deal. And they snatch them all up. And then they just don't realize you just go to every liquor store and there's still bottles sitting on the shelves for a long time. Yeah. So this one, it's only from 2022, but it is one with coffee. And the coffee flavor does dip after a long enough time. So I do like to drink these sooner. But this is a, a nice little uh, mm. breakfast for us here. Lovely. I have been awake now for just today. About 47 minutes, and I'm already drinking a stout, and that's just... A bourbon stout. Yeah. But the There's Packers play at noon, so it's going to... I mean... It's going to be big. It's going to be a good day. Yeah, I'm totally going to watch it. But like I was saying, um, <laughs> it's very difficult to get information um, about uh, Miyazaki's personal life because yeah. he doesn't want to talk about it. He says the games are what they are, and I don't want to talk about who I am, but... That's true. That's true artistry. So I, that's that's brilliant. I think it's great, too. I mean, the art needs to speak for itself, but yeah. we're not doing that today. I read a lot of interviews, and I found out some stuff. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's it's true what they say, though. Like, like nobody's a saint, even people you feel like you admire. And by removing themselves from the art, they actually do the art more of a service. Yeah. I mean, if there's a preconceived notions, if you find out somebody was, you know— heavily involved in protesting or a certain yeah. political ideology, it'll shade your uh, feelings about something before you even see it. Well, there's something to be said yeah. about public figures doing that. The more you know but about Zack Snyder, the less you want to watch his movies. It's definitely true. Yeah. And with like more and more stuff coming about that, coming out about that 70s show, I, it's, I find it hard to rewatch one of my favorite shows. Well, it's, yeah. But he grew up tremendously poor, Miyazaki. That's his words. Uh, keen reader, borrowed from the library. He couldn't read all the words because uh, a lot of them were in English. He wasn't able to read. So he would create the rest of the stories in his head. He would see the images and just imagine stuff, which I, he has said is a very like precursor to his approach to storytelling mm -hmm. in, in his video games. Loves tabletop games, game books. He likes to refer to himself as an absolutely indoor person i dig that man of my heart <laughs> yeah i'm quite the indoor person parents restricted him from video games until he was old enough to attend university where i mean fuck so he didn't start playing games till he was it was like the late 80s then early wow. 90s yeah yeah wild he attended Keough University and graduated with a degree in social science, later getting a job as an account manager for the U.S.-based Oracle Corporation. He did this to pay for his sister's college tuition fees. What a gem. Cool dude. Yeah. Upon a friend's recommendation, Miyazaki played the 2001 video game Eco. Oh, wow. And this caused him to change his career and become a video game designer. Have you guys Eco. played Eco? No, I wanted to ask no. you about it. I... Okay, so Eco is one of those, like, watershed games. Um, I played a little bit of it at the time, but I remember playing it in depth uh, around, like, 2011. They released the Shadow of the Colossus Eco bundle for the PlayStation 3 mm -hmm. with HD graphics. And uh, that is one of those games that I do not think ages particularly well because it was a very firm concept of almost like a survival horror and the whole thing is an escort mission you're this little horned boy who is kind of cursed and is trying to yeah the it's covers been, it's really been, bad it's been ranked as one of like the worst video game covers yes. of all time where look up the japanese one it's way better it's gorgeous yeah and uh, <laughs> that fucking it's like horrible it's, it's like it's like the other one is just like concept art you're this little horned boy and you're leading this for, yep, that's a really good cover. It looks cover. like Salvador Dali. Yeah, mixed with that Polish guy that painted all the hellscapes and was stabbed a whole bunch of times. I can never pronounce his, his oh, name. Um, it's oh, like, my God. Uh, starts with his, his last name starts with a Z, I think. Uh, but it's fine. Eco, horned boy, Eco, escort mission. Uh, it's basically one long escort mission where you're leading this girl and nobody really speaks a language that you've ever heard. It's all kind of made up. It's all like, it's very artsy. It's one of those games that was so artsy, in fact, that a lot of people just didn't understand it. 
because they a lot of people at the time and obviously 2001 people weren't thinking of video games as art that's just not what was going on they, yeah the the medium was in a transition phase and part of it was uh getting out of gameplay and focusing so much on cinematic look and graphics yeah. and realism. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah, I've never played eco. I think it's one of those games that's kind of of its time. If you missed it, you it's hard to revisit. Maybe well, their, their follow up shadow. Of the Colossus is still utterly playable. Yeah. Beautiful. One of my favorites. It's in my top 10. Definitely. Um, I would say that eco did give me pause even when I was 11 years old. Like I played it on someone else's PlayStation two. Cause I'm like, what the fuck is up with this game? And he's like, you probably won't like it. I don't really like it. And I'm like, I want to, I want to try it. Yeah. And so I did. And I you was used to wear of, horns around everywhere. Well, I have to shave them down. I'm like Hellboy. You're like Daniel Radcliffe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, no, it's a, we'll I talk about see, Hellboy later. Actually. I can see how an adult man might actually like witness something like this for the first time and go, Oh fuck. Well, to uh, he's 29 years old, uh-huh. and he plays Eco. He's like, I'm changing careers right now. Yeah. And so he's 29 years old, and Miyazaki found out that few video game companies would hire somebody with zero experience <laughs> making video games. Mm-hmm. Who would have thought, right? Yeah. But From Software was one of the few that did. So he changed his career. And spoiler warning, within 10 years, he's company president. Almost completely unprecedented in Japan. He he speed he speed ran the corporate ladder. He just fucking crushed it, dude. That's impressed. Ten years. Ten years. He became company president. That's fucking wild. That's that's pretty interesting because it all of his gameplay philosophy is like, yes, everything is hard, everything is difficult, but if you try, <laughs> you can do it. And he's fucking living proof, man. Yeah, I, I, he makes he makes difficult things like climbing a corporate ladder seem easy. He got well, good. Well, they asked me to be the boss at my job, and I said, no, let the younger generation. Well, that just means that I have exactly nine years to become the president of A24. If, once you start working there. If yeah, you ever start well, I've already there. lost a year, too, because I'm 30, and he was 29. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, if you can dream it, you can do it. There's, there's no time frame on when success happens. Uh, many people get it later in life, George R. R. Martin. But we'll get to him. Uh, so 2004, he started as a coder. His first game he worked on was Armored Core Last Raven. 2005, he was a planner. 11th entry in the Armored Core series. Did you Have you played a lot of the older ones? No. no not even close. No. Uh, my introduction to the Armored Core series was the Xbox 360 era. So He then worked on Armored Core 4 in 2006 is when that game came out. He was started as main planner, got promoted to director. So second game he worked on, he's getting promoted to director pretty quick. That game rules, yeah. by the way. Uh, it was a little controversial at the time, right? Like, because it kind of changed a lot of things. It made it much more difficult. Who saw that coming? <laughs> uh, it, there's a lot more sorties, or what they're called, like battles, and they're all straightforward. Not a lot of um, character portraits or models. It's everything's done through like dialogue. Very straightforward. Yeah. He said he was in charge of the story, setting, design, and game systems. Uh, Armored Core, Armored Core for Answer, 2008 director for that. And those were the three games he worked on before Demon Souls. Mm-hmm. Demon Souls, he was director. At the time, Sony wanted From Software to make a game to compete with Oblivion. Yeah. Makes sense. I mean, Oblivion yeah. was the big hot shit at the time. Yeah. Well, that that's so, so that's so strange though. Oblivion had come out in 2004. I don't know the time frame. Probably around there. It was 2004 because 2011 then was Skyrim. Yeah. Timeline kind of works out. Yeah. While working on the Armored Core series, he heard that a game called Demon Souls wasn't doing well. Problems with the team. And then they, they had been unable to create a compelling prototype. He heard it was a fantasy action RPG. And he said he wanted it and he wanted to take control. Uh, since his uh, reasoning was the game was already a failure, I can't fail. Like, I mean, it's already fucked. So at worst, it just stays fucked. That's a that's a good way. Honestly, that's how I pretty much live every day. Yeah. Like, <laughs> me, me I'm too. already fucked. So, I mean, it can only go up from here. Yeah, I mean, it's true. Last night, I won a Steinholding competition. I'm like, 
I expected nothing from my life. And look at me now. Be the change you want to see in the world, Brad. Hold more steins. Yeah, it was great. I mean, it's all those jacking off muscles. <laughs> it was an entire week of shoveling is what it was. Or maybe he got zapped being an electrician. He's got powers and we don't know about I, him yet. I'm like Jamie Foxx. You're not blue enough. I just jumped Boy. in a vat of eels and my gap between my teeth closed. <laughs> why is it always a vat? It's a vat of something always. Well, I'm just like, why do RPGs always have sluice gates? You're not going to run into sluice gates in the real world on a day-to-day basis anyways. But... Miyazaki comes in, immediately changes everything. Demon Souls originally was going to be first person. And that would have been a bad choice. Yep. He said that's not going to work for the game he wants to make. <clears throat> During Well, one of the big design things that you'll find with Miyazaki games is difficulty. Making the game difficult was never the goal. What we primarily aim for is to provide a sense of accomplishment. Which I... Yeah, one at the together. end of the day you get there you can bash your head against i mean souls games are what people don't understand when they talk about difficulty is they the easy mode is literally getting more runes or whatever more souls that's how you make the game easier for yourself you might have to farm a little you might have to put in the work but ultimately it's kind of simple like you can really just figure out a way to do it it's not difficult it can be annoying but not difficult the trick would be to just plug in a game shark or whatever and just get infinite health if you couldn't die from five hits for most enemies that would that would do it yeah but he has said if you are knocked down i want you to fall because of the player otherwise um the player will not think about growing or strategizing it's unreasonable to die because of a gamer system. It's always not good to win probabilistically. Probabilistically. That's a tough one. I try not to be something like you can win if you do it over and over. If you don't if you don't point out as a game that it's your fault, it's challenging to operate, it's unreasonable, or it's one hundredth of a critical hit, it is a little different. I care about that. I mean, that's you, not a philosophy that's in it's not a mainstream philosophy by any means. I mean, you can play any fucking game on the market that's mass marketed to people. I mean, fuck, the majority of RPG games that come out now, if you pre-order it or you pay a little extra, they give you a shit ton of starting gear that makes you way OP for the first six, seven hours of the game. If you buy 10 Mountain Dews, you're going to get the armor. And kidney stones. Well, inter- interesting <laughs> enough, in Star- it's in, true. In Starfield, they do, because I got like that early pack to play it early and that's that shit just becomes useless pretty damn quick it helps you out at the beginning but then it's just like nah i never use it because i it's not earned Mm. and it well i earned it with my wallet but i didn't earn it in game i bought 10 candy bars to get special items in final fantasy 7 remake that's i entered the receipt online and was sent a code that is who I am. What did what you, kind of what did you fucking get? I don't remember. I think it was like a summon or like special armor or bangles or something. But I'm was, like, I was going to eat candy bars probably at some point anyway. So I just had them in a drawer for a while. If it was 10 Snickers, you win, win then. It's a win, win. Yeah. Plus you get diabetes. Yeah. If it's an almond joy. No, what's that coconut one? Then you lost. Oh boy. What are those called? Bad. That's what they're called. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. That fake coconut really sucks Ugh. ass. Another design aspect that he showed early on, open-ended storytelling. He Most of these are from interviews. Uh, check out Don Don RV. He has a lot of great essays on a website, and he just recently started doing YouTube videos. And he's very new, but big following already. Like, The Making of Dark Souls is already up to like 40,000 views, and he's a young uh, YouTuber. But he's Louise. I want to leave the discovery and interpretation of the world's lore and stories to the players. This is the main reason why I focus on environment and subtle storytelling. Instead of the game automatically telling the story, the players will get more value from it if they discover hints of the plot from items and people they encounter in the world. Yeah. One of the my favorite parts of the Soul style of games. It's it's refreshing because when you first start one of these games, sometimes you get a preamble and it kind of gives you like the 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 core con the core conceit of what the mythology is. Yeah, or they give you some vague hints of what your character is supposed to be doing, and then they kind of just let you go right. They, they tell you "fuck off," do what you need to do. But in, what they do is instead of uh, giving you um, a big like, "here is the story and the mission," they give you like ten questions and the mission. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. When you start Elden Ring, they're like, the loathsome dung eater. I'm like, what the fuck is Who's this that guy? guy? Horaloo? Like, what are we talking about here? I was like several hours into Elden Ring, and my brother walked in and was like, what are you playing? Elden Ring? What is it about? Don't know. I, <laughs> still don't know. Swords. <laughs> well, I, mean, I just kill shit. You start Bloodborne, you know almost nothing. They say almost nothing. You're just like getting a blood transfusion, and then there's these little dudes grabbing yep. you, and you just wake up, and there's a werewolf. And you're like, what the fuck is happening? They do, I don't, it didn't have a preamble of any sort? Um, I don't believe it even as a narration. It just kind of shows the streets of Yarnum, and then you're getting like a blood transfusion from some guy. You can find a note later on that says you came looking for your blood to be purified. I forget what it was. But no, there's not like, you learn very quickly that a plague is spread through Yarnum. Be careful out there. <coughs> you don't know almost any, like, where that story goes. I kind of remember that being jarring when I first played it. It, it was uh, clever, though, the way it just seemed like we're making a horror game about werewolves and, you know, beasts, and then it just opens up to, no, this is cosmic horror of the biggest kind. Another design element found in Demon Souls, leaving messages for each other in the game world. Uh, you can warn of nearby hazards or trick players to their deaths or fingers and buttholes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, social mechanics in a single player game that has since become very popularized. Yeah. Uh, because they use, you have to use templates. Uh, that's the most interesting part about it. You can't just, it, it really gets rid of a lot of problems that a lot of games like this could have had if they just let the player type in whatever they wanted to. Yeah. Because I, then all you would see was the N word everywhere, pretty much. Yeah. With Mario, true. with Mario Maker, Mario Maker, when you play with those on, your screen just gets covered with like drawings and this horrible shit. Yeah. Uh, I like Mario Wonders' approach, which seems like they're. I haven't, you know, we haven't played it yet. This might be out afterwards, but um, the way that you can just see like the ghosts of players and what they did. Wait, when does it come out again? Soon. Uh, we're we're recording this the second week of football. Um, September 16th, uh, if anyone's listening. But no, you, Wonder has that same mechanic mm-hmm. where you can see the ghosts of other players or leave items for people, which uh, anytime that, I mean, that's become a thing now because single player games uh, in an online universe, this was one of the progenitors of that idea. Yeah. There's, I mean, that's, that's maybe the most interesting part about it is that there's also lore reasons as to why you're finding all these messages it's people from other realms or if it's in, in universe in dark souls. They say that uh, one character states that time is kind of folding in on itself. And there are probably multiple yous out there trying to achieve the same thing. It's really kind of dope. Yeah. Yeah. It's very mythological. It's, yeah. it's like a real Ouroboros of storytelling, which I always appreciate. And goddamn every single game, they will find a different conceit on why it's happening in these universes. Yeah. Yep. There's always a bonfire. It's there's always a lighthouse. There's always a, you know, a reason for you to come back to life after you die a thousand times. Miyazaki had the idea for this after his car became trapped in snow on a hill. A group of strangers pushed the vehicle to the top and then they all disappeared soundlessly into the night. He never got to talk to him. It was probably like a quick thank you. And he's like, that left a big impression on him. He's like, who are those people? Where'd they go? Just. It's Midwest is what it is. Yeah. They went to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the kind of shit you do actually get in the Midwest. <laughs> uh, he had meetings with Sony to like show where the game was. He made sure to purposely not talk about the difficulty and kind of bury it in the presentation behind everything else. Uh, he was, he feared they would remove it. Disastrous reception at the Tokyo game show a few months before release. <laughs> Many players didn't make it past the character creation screen. Uh, also at the Tokyo Game Show were games such as Halo 3, Prince of Persia, and Bayonetta. Some big, like, prestige titles that would leave a big mark. And Demon Souls just like, no, fuck you. This game is not the prettiest. It's just the, the most challenging. Well, Bayonetta wasn't the hit it was going to be at the time. Even early on, people did think it looked dumb. Because they didn't understand, like, the thesis of it, how it's supposed to be, like, just kind of a really weird, dumb action movie with a sexy witch. It's really all it is. Sign me up. And she has guns everywhere. Sign me up Guns again. everywhere. 
Yeah, pretty much. And she become she can become a tr- she can she can become a train. See, I didn't know I needed that in my life until like what was it earlier this year? Well, <laughs> but you wouldn't even believe what happened to me and Dylan yesterday. We were at Bayview Bash and a furry gave us beans. I still have it. The, and, okay, so I the, did wait, no, we don't, see this is one of those things. If we explain it more, the mystery goes away, like in Dark Souls. I'd rather you not know who this furry was and why they gave us beans or what these beans do. But he's digging through his pockets. He might have beans. You, yesterday was peculiar. Something weird was going on. I was really hungover at a gas station getting some Pedialyte, and I looked up, and the fucking mystery, bean. the mystery machine drove by. So this with bean, we do in it. This bean is a key item. Um, it mm-hmm. says, given to Dylan by a mysterious furry. Yeah. Its meaning is unknown and its purpose is clouded in mystery. It was a it's very colorful. smiling at me, though. The bean is smiling at you is the last mm-hmm. thing that it says. And then someone wrote 30 paragraphs about what this could mean. When really, we don't know who that furry was. We don't know why he, or they, who they were. They showed up on a bike. We took a picture and they gave us beans. It looks like a, possibly a, not a pinto. We think it might be a beanstalk to go to to go to heaven, to heaven <laughs> to go to Richard Ayawade's fable We're, uh, to the heavy side layer. If I can uh, do cats, uh, <laughs> <laughs> always down to do some cats. Yeah, uh, Dylan, you are a curious cat. I I'm kind of more of a, a myst, mystophilio Mephisto. Me, me, uh, no, Mephistopheles. 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 Yeah. Oh. Magical Mr. Mephistopheles. That sounds like a the demon. The tuxedo cat. The game performed uh, horribly on release. It sold 20,000 copies in the first week. It got good reviews, though. Due to the poor release, Sony decided against localizing the game for Western markets. They would regret this. The game was licensed in North America by Altus USA, and Bandai Namco would publish for the PAL regions. Atlas. Atlas, yeah. Um, not the Altus Plateau. Yes. <laughs> Word spread, however, of the complex <laughs> armor and weapon systems, the severe punishment, not simply a power fantasy, but a test of skill. Within months, sales passed 100,000, and the game found a publisher in the West. It became a big fucking deal. The, that's the price to pay, unfortunately, for introducing new, interesting concepts. Yeah, challenging people is tough. They're not going to get it yeah. right away, necessarily. I mean... Do you remember uh, stories of when, like, Super Mario 64 came out, completely redefined, like, the idea of what a platformer was, and they would have guides and little videotapes in Japan to give to, like, older people who could not literally process having a 3D platformer or how that might actually work. So they're like, this controls the camera. That's the whole reason Lakitu is a camera in it. Did you know that? No. Yeah. It's it's literally so that people could visualize themselves as the cameraman. It helped so them that, comprehend how the how the yeah how the, how, yeah how the camera itself works. That's wild. Yeah. Yep. It's pretty dope when you think about it. Uh, speaking on the design process, he has this is him describing what his design process was in his early career. Uh, two main categories. One is providing designers with simple keywords that they would brainstorm during the early stages and allow them to design freely. Uh, test the images and provide feedback. He says, if I didn't receive the results I expected, I began giving more specific descriptions and might even start drawing things on a whiteboard. But even then, I would never go as far as to say it has to be this color or this shape. I do not intend for the designers to become my tools. Things don't always go as I want, but I believe that's probably due to me not getting the most out of the artists. This is one of the things I want to get better at in the future. Can he be my fucking boss? Can he be all of, like, the world's boss? Can he just, like, run countries, too? That is a level of, like, zen that not a lot of people can achieve. I think of the Star Wars prequels and yeah. all of the designers for the the artwork and the characters. Uh-huh. And George Lucas comes in, and they all get fucking terrified and quiet. And he brings in a marker and just puts big X's on, like, half of the shit. And people are like, oh, God, my, no. Ugh. And like someone who made Dexter Jester, they're like, yes, yes. Yeah, true. Yeah. I, he loved Dexter Jester. He's like, it's cool. It's like a 50s diner, but in outer space. <laughs> and yeah, you just can't predict. And he comes in, uh, you know, uh, making big decisions. But I like that Miyazaki lets the people just kind of design stuff and just maybe like move it over that way. Well, and- when you have a happy workforce, 
they do better work. And in a creative field, when they have when they're happy, they're content, and they think that their creativity is going to be seen and heard and recognized, then you're only setting yourself up for success. Do you, you think have it creative was people doing every, their job. Do you think it was pizza parties every day? At least bi weekly. Okay. At least. And yeah. it was probably like it it was probably like And they weren't like the thin slices you get when you're no, in No, there was probably some nice like I, I'm local an under spot. I'm an extremely underpaid teacher. I got one large pizza for twenty people. We only get one piece. I'm sorry I'm trying. You guys gotta share. The, the yeah, crust. I know that's 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 what I was gonna say too. You you judge it so hard as a kid, but then it's just like, well, the school didn't fucking pay for this. Yeah. It's out of that teacher's pocket. Mrs. Yeah. Linquist did, and she's the best. We she had got mi- you full slices. <laughs> we had Mr. Linquist. We had Mr. Linquist, and he wasn't great. You had a Mr. Linquist? Uh, we made a feature film when we were in high school. It was really bad, but we played at the theater. And he was he gave actually the best review. He was like, it made no sense, and I hated it. I'm like, yeah. It didn't make sense. And I appreciate your honesty. Everyone That's else awesome. was like, it was great. Um, did you write the script? No, my buddy did. But I played Dick Murphy. I was the least straight cop on the force. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that for you. <laughs> and the other part of the design process, once basic details are settled, make more detailed design requests, how something will be used, where it will be used, and specific purpose and representation of the game. So, you know, for like Bloodborne, they would say uh, beasts, um, outer gods, and Victorian, like, you know, keywords or whatever. And then people would go from there and then they would see the designs and they would work it into the lore or push them into certain areas, which is cool. Demon Souls um, wasn't still like a major hit, but it was the cult hit in Growing Steam. It uh it got reviewed very well in Game Informer, and that actually kind of changed my mind about getting it. Because mm-hmm. I got it like the year and a half after its release in 2009. And I was just like, well, I got to try this fucking shit out. I was bored one summer, and I'm like, just a meaty RPG. Let's just do it. Just meaty. Because I wanted to play Dark Souls itself, because that got like 10 out of 10s in a lot of places. But I was like, I should start from the beginning. So I did. Yeah. Dark Souls. Yep. Came out 2011. He was director and producer. Bandai Namco is... Same day as Skyrim. Did it come out same day as Skyrim? I believe it came out the same day as Skyrim. That's some big dick energy right there. That is. It, or very close. I don't quite recall. Uh, Bandai Namco is the partner. Since mm-hmm. they batted for him, they're like, all right, we're with you. Sorry, Sony. Yeah. How uh, ex- how exclusive was Dark Souls when it came out to PS3? PS3 was what it originally came out on, correct? In PC, yeah. Was it on Xbox? I, I think so, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because Cause, uh, cause it, when you port it to the West, it's got to be, you have the need, you need the most proliferation possible. Yeah. And it w- a lot more people had 360s. So couldn't call it Demon Souls because the IP belonged to Sony. Great. Was tentatively, okay, we'll talk about, you know, the titles that it was almost called? Uh, I used to. Was tentatively called Dark Race, <laughs> as they were a race of cursed people known as the Dark Race. It was changed for some obvious reasons. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this was brought up two days before the Tokyo Game Show, which is why the game ended up being announced with the placeholder title of Project Dark. They then considered Dark Lord or Dark Ring. They settled on Dark Ring because they found out. Uh, no, they they settled on not using Dark Ring because they found out a slang for anus in England. I was gonna say, yeah, that sounds. Just like a butthole. <laughs> I call them rusty sheriff's badges. So they but. almost called it dark race and anus. Yeah. Which actually, uh, I'm fine with either of those titles. Yeah. I, I still would have played it probably. Uh, one thing that he began, Miyazaki began being known for around this time was acting out performances to explain characters and like uh, enemy specific movements and oh. things for cutscenes. He would act them out. I like that. That's cool. Uh, on design with maps. You ever seen the gaping demon or the gaping dragon? I'm just picturing. Can you just look up the gaping dragon? I'll look it up. Yeah. I look up gaping uh, dragon. Okay. Um, put dark souls gaping dragon. I don't and, know what else you'll you find watch in there. I'm just picturing him doing the movements of the gaping dragon. Yeah. Um, it's basically a dragon where its entire chest opens up. Yeah, just squatting and, and he just rah, rah, he basically just pulls down. a Zoidberg a little bit, <laughs> pretty <laughs> much. Yeah, why not runs. gaping dragon? <laughs> yeah, you fi- that's the big boss of the uh, the sewer area. That thing looks gross. That thing's huge. It's that one thing, of the biggest bosses in Dark Souls. It I think. looks 
the photos kind of gave me a little bit of goosebumps. That thing looks real gross. It's a difficult fight, too. So Demon Souls, the maps are largely not connected, right? Like they're kind of, no. you they're almost like um, levels that you shoot through in one direction. Okay. It's not open-ended. You have a hub point, and then they shoot out in multiple directions. Because in Dark Souls, mm-hmm. one of the big things he was concerned with, uh, concerned with was maps. He yeah. wanted large and continuous, interconnected world through a central hub area. It's all about verticality. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Um, you, there's so many video games you can just draw a map out for. Impossible for his games. Nope, it's impossible. Actually, someone actually did do it. And it's like this tiered system of... It's got to be like 3D. It's almost like a DNA helix. It's really awesome. <laughs> It's insane. Um, I saw somebody for the sewers under Lane Dell make a 3D map of how it worked, and they actually just showed water pouring through it to describe how to like how it mo- you move through the map. And even then, I'm like, this is barely comprehensible. Yep. Um, bonfires was also something that he was concerned about. Another big design thing for Miyazaki is naming. He has said in interviews, I'm kind of a naming nerd. I enjoy the whole process, things like word origins, how it sounds in expressions, regional variations, the whole thing. And less item description means less needs to be changed if something changes and finds it more interesting and charming to have fewer uh, words describing uh, the world. I uh, One of the, the most unique things in my experience with the Souls games mm-hmm. is... Just the vernacular, the vocabulary that is used that uh, of words that you don't hear in everyday conversation. So especially in like Dark Souls, you will enter a new area and it will say like the Darkwood Forest or the, the Darkwoods or something like that. Like it's almost its own level of foreboding. Like it'll just appear across the screen. Like, oh, you're in a new fucking area and I guarantee you, you're going to be afraid. One of the things I also bring up is that ostensibly I think that Dark Souls is... A survival horror game. It reads as survival horror all the way through it because it is looking around corners. It's being afraid to take a leap. It's being it, like your sense of fear is so like prevalent that first playthrough that you're just like, well, what the hell am I supposed to do now? When you turn a corner and see a basilisk, that is a fear. Yes. That is a real fear. Yep. And the fact that it's so grounded in the camera, so focused on the character it in your character no matter how you buff it it's still going to feel clunky Mm -hmm. you're a knight usually you're a knight style character in this because spells aren't super great in the first dark souls yeah and a lot of it is literally conserving stamina knowing when to block knowing when to dodge making sure you don't fat roll (laughs) i've I've loved explaining that to people the fact that i i mean i played Elden Ring for a good while before you said, oh, you heavy roll? I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, and then you you dropped or you lighten your load. You're like, I am a leaf in the wind. Mm-hmm. I get more iframes? Yep. <laughs> you definitely do. I, I mean, and iframes is something that I don't know how popular it was back in the day. It was a concept that I found unfamiliar in most games for a long time. But now I, were... I play Shredder's Revenge Turtles. So I was playing that last night. Iframes when you dodge. Mm-hmm. If games don't have iframes when I dodge now, I find it untenable. Yeah, if you can still get caught. Uh, see, I kind of like it because if you're rolling towards the enemy, there should be no eye. Like iframes should literally be like you dodge backwards, dodge to the side. Yeah. But there's got to be like a full 180 where you can still get hit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. It's It's a little more realistic that way, I guess. Yeah, that just makes sense. Because if you roll into your enemy and the enemy swing down a hammer, you don't get to just survive that. <laughs> no, it doesn't count because I was running towards you. <laughs> <laughs> the hammer part didn't hit me. It was just the hill. <laughs> this game's broken. I fucking hate it, dude. This game sucks. <laughs> I want to play Kingdom Hearts where there's no penalty. I, w- I was talking to someone when, I, when we were first playing the game, and they were just like, man, this fucking blows. I just keep dying all the time. It took me a long time to get to the first section of Bloodborne. And once I beat the first boss, I was like, oh, I've never felt so good about myself. I made it to the first boss of Bloodborne like two months ago. Mm -hmm. And then I died real quickly. Then you just gave up? Uh, I was waiting on another game to come out. 
because I was like, I don't have time between Elden Ring and whatever game I was waiting on to play. Yeah, to start Bloodborne, but it's on my list. I have it installed on my PlayStation there's, currently. There's gonna be a remastered version. I gotta believe the the fact that people are. I mean, eventually people clamber for you know an FF7 remake long enough. They just have to do it because it's printing money. And the fact that they could remaster Bloodborne and print money, I do want a just a 60 frames per second HD remaster. I don't want a remake. Bloodborne's perfect the way it is. Don't re-record anything. Don't change the combat. Just make it prettier. They, yeah, they should just bump up the textures a little bit. That's all I want. Yeah, because there were some... Bloodborne, and one of the things you'll probably get into when talking about these games is that there are a lot of um, what I would call unfinished sections because I feel like his uh, I, his eyes were hungrier than his, stom- or like, than his stomach could handle. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. There are a lot of sections in these games where you just walk into it and you're just like, oh, you just, oh, okay. Like very clear demarcations of like, this was so well thought out in this area is just woof. Yeah. Um, Outsold its predecessor in a week, Dark Souls 1. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Dark Souls was uh, hyped up. It had a following. So Dark Souls 2 came out in 2014. He was a supervisor on this game because we would find out later he was very busy on a couple other things. Um, it was revealed and announced same day that Miyazaki would not be the director, partially due to working on Dark Souls 1 DLC and beginning work on Bloodborne. He already he says, I already received plenty of chances, and if somebody else in From Software could take that same chance and excel in it, the company could grow as an organization. Also speaking as a creator, as I have shared in other interviews, I would like to see what kind of possibilities will result when the, the direction of Dark Souls is unshackled from myself. Come on. This dude is just good at being a leader. You want to know what the result of that was? Have you guys played Dark Souls 2? No, I heard it's not as good. Uh, but actually, it is. there's so much DNA of Bloodborne in there. Oh, really? That's why I took to Bloodborne very quickly. Oh, things are a little quicker. Um Everything in the environment means a little bit more in Dark Souls 2. Uh, there's a lot more like navigation and almost like navigation as puzzle. Because this this is a game where, much like Demon Souls, you're in one hub world and then things shoot up in different directions. Yeah. It's almost Metroidvania. I've heard um, people just have like roller coasters with Dark Souls 2 where they're like, oh, it's not the same and it's different. And then people it's like, PG- actually came around and it's really great and I love it. It's PvP is still my favorite. Yeah, it's my it's it's better than one. I hated one's PvP mostly because I got stomped because there's only so many items in the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, a principle that Miyazaki has claimed to have around this time was total direction or total control, full control and direction of the game. He has final say on all text, all names, the story and the lore, background music and sound effects. Cutscenes and artwork, map and level design. Um, he ha- says he has full accountability in all decisions, gives creative freedom to his members, but he promotes synergy at the same time. Everything must pass his approval, though, for the final product. Character design, weapon design, armor design, boss fights and combat. He, at this time, wanted his hands, just everything to pass through him mm-hmm. to give like final approval for everything. That final boss in Dark Souls 2 is really disappointing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's how so? It she doesn't do a lot, and she's really easy to kill. Uh, it's the queen. Okay. Of this land, I don't quite remember her name, but she's got a giant scythe. That can work though. Um, where the final boss is disappointing because the boss is actually not uh, physically challenging. It's just yeah. It's more accurate to who they might be. I don't yeah. know. I haven't played it. it there were some okay, so Dark Souls Two got a lot of flack because all the boss fights were humanoids. Essentially, there weren't a lot of beasts. So after a while, you just get sick of like, okay, well, you're just a big slow guy, or you're a small quick lady, or something like that, and it's just like, well, okay. We are going to take a quick break to hear from another amazing show from the Tokyo Bee Podcast Network, and we're going to talk about getting promoted to company president. Love it, yeah. <laughs> Uh-huh. 
spaceships, magic swords, intergalactic empires, dead gods, and creatures from beyond the moon. What Mad Universe could contain all these fantastic visions? What Mad Universe is a bi-weekly podcast delving into the misty origins of sci-fi and fantasy, pop culture and genre tropes. Take a cosmic trip on What Mad Universe podcast, now on the Tokyo Beat Podcast Network. Today's show is brought to you by Epos Gaming Audio. With a comprehensive lineup of both wired and wireless headsets, gaming amplifiers, microphones, and webcams, Epos has everything you need to experience the power of audio. Like their H6 Pro lineup, which features two versions, an open or closed headset. The closed headset allows you to tap into exceptionally detailed audio and seals out ambient noise, while the open version delivers natural high fidelity audio with an incredible soundstage. Both headsets include a magnetic detachable microphone and a sleek design that has no wild RGB configurations, just good design. Listeners can save 15% by visiting www.eposaudio.com slash gaming and entering code EPOSFRIEND15 at checkout. That is EPOSFRIEND15 at checkout. I refer to myself as dignified trash. You know, you're trash like, with a moral code. I'm, I'm trash with a moral code. I have lines that I draw, and a lot of that revolves around. Ah, this is going to cause me a lot of trouble in the future. <laughs> I'm just still thinking about who the fuck that furry was that gave us beans. Well, that's the weirdest thing that's happened to me this year. I think a furry gave you a bean. A furry is it gave weird me that I? Bean. Is it weird that I didn't even really like clock it? <laughs> I brought it over. I'm like, I got a rock. And they're like, no, that's a bean. I was like, what the fuck is this gross? And I said, ooh, I want a bean. And then I went over to get a magic bean. He like taps me. <laughs> Do I went over to get a bean? <laughs> and then he taps me on the shoulder. And I go, yes, please. I'll have a bean. And I said, thank you. And I was shook it his a hand. full body suit? It was suit? a full body furry costume. <clears throat> and they were riding on like a tricycle bike. Was, that makes it. You didn't mention the tricycle bike. Yeah, it was kind that of That makes like, it even more special. And he, it was, he was donned in like, oh, wait, there's a picture of us with. <laughs> Hell yeah. It makes less <laughs> sense when you look at the picture. We'll post, it, mean, for the, we'll yeah, post it, it for the Discord. It makes much less sense, but at least now I have a visual. <laughs> Why are they, can they see out of these fake glasses on top of their furry suit? I, Dylan, you look confused. <laughs> Did that, you guys get rained on? I made on? a face. No, no, I didn't rain on us. Um, so 2014... Miyazaki is promoted to president. He was currently the director for Bloodborne and Dark Souls 3. Neither have been announced yet. And they're like, you want to be president? Meanwhile, he's directing two games. His condition was that he would still be able to remain actively involved in game development. Uh, Quotations. I am a game director serving as a company president and not the other way around. Fortunately for those around me, they understand my position on this matter. As the new president of From Software, I am planning to initiate several new projects. I can't really say exactly what they are. These could be something like sci-fi, but you would have to stay tuned for more info about this in the future. I've heard I've heard tell stories of him trying to develop a sci-fi concept. Sounds cool. Uh, Yeah, uh, apparently it just he he got stuck on the idea of guns and gunplay, and. Th- these are from like insiders that I've read on like Reddit because Reddit does what Reddit does. Mm-hmm. I wish I could find the, the groups of it. Bloodborne wound up using guns and they had to do it in a way that just like completely nerfed them. But they, they're yeah. they're for parrying primarily. Yeah. And they're catching people off guard, really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they had to like really lower the power. Uh, we are drinking a, a new drink. It's not a beer. This is called 19th Tea from Milwaukee Brewing. Ooh. It's a hard tea and lemonade, a hard Arnold Palmer. Amazingly great. It's a perfect after work drink after a long day. Or after this 18 This is holes. fucking good. Mm-hmm. Eagle Park bought Milwaukee Brewing, and this is one of their new products, and I'm just a big fan. Me too. Uh, Miyazaki said, well, honestly, I think I'm probably neglecting a, a big number of my presidential duties. Or you could say that everyone around me is indulging me on that front. If we put it in percentages, I probably am about 20% doing president stuff, 80% doing game design stuff. 
hundred percent doing dope shit. No. I'll, t- I'll tell you what, this I sounds like, that. he also sounds like a man who knows how to delegate properly, which is one of the, which is the most important part of any leadership position Yeah, is whether or not you're giving people too much or too little, or you're letting them kind of do what their expertise is. Let them take over what they can take over and take it off yeah. of your plate so you can do what you need to do. Well, yeah. at th- and at this point, he's kind of a, at this point in the company, he had to have sort of become this kind of hero like he saved a very small struggling developer that made very niche games and made those niche games popular with an audience that probably wouldn't have gone in that direction if there wasn't like a proper amount of buzz sorry hiccups yeah (laughs) um started assigning co-directors to projects to assign with all design aspects um bloodborne Came out in 2015. Brad, I think I heard you like this game. I'm a little bit into Bloodborne. Yeah, I I heard you might have played it. I might have gotten a bunch of tattoos. Uh, (laughs) August 2012, Sony. (laughs) Yeah, my whole lower right pant. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sony Computer Entertainment approached from software about cooperative development on a new title. Yo, we're really sorry. We kind of fucked up Demon's Souls. Can we do anything? We'll do anything Mm -hmm. to get you back. And Miyazaki said, how about the possibility of developing a game for eight generation consoles and Bloodborne started there. Victorian, arcane technology, Bram Stoker-esque nightmares. Miyazaki took the team and visited Romania and the Czech Republic. He has said it carries the DNA of Demon Souls. Uh, Quotations. The game's mechanics or the gothic, gothic theme, for example, were some ideas or concepts that were always brewing for me. And among those that I always wanted to achieve in my career. So when the trigger was pulled, I knew that was... This was it. From the start of the project, the main premise was to create a serious game for people who like games. On top of that, we have several themes throughout the various layers of the game. The three major ones are exploring the unknown, the feeling of fighting for one's life, and the new online elements. He personally laid out all the maps in Bloodborne. Story is purposefully open and not explained in parts. Co-authored the narrative and no shield to hide behind. Guns were a tough decision, he said. Yeah. Uh, I think this put a lot of people out of their comfort zones. There aren't nearly as many weapons in this game. Really not. No. It's And I remember being disappointed by that. The, the, the weapons are all very, though, uh, refined and yeah. have their own strengths in different ways. It's It was pretty balanced. I wish I could see the infographic. Uh, from people who start out the game and what weapon they chose, because I'm gonna guess the uh, cleaver is but probably the most popular. The saw. The saw. I yeah. chose the one that like like a switchblade pops out yep. and gets long saw. because it's on the cover art. Well, maybe, I, but and it and it feels. I mean, it just looks the coolest initially as well. I, was, I chose the whip sword. I was told yeah. that the, is it the cane or the whip? Sword? The cane. The cane. Yeah. Not to use threaded that. cane. Yeah, threaded I was cane. told not to use that. Oh, I don't know. I Maybe my anyway. buddy thought I wouldn't be good enough. It's it's all about quick movements and dodging, but you can get them to bleed quicker. And the and the, the whole concept of if you're losing health, you get a temp, you have a small yep. opportunity, a window like to go that. back in. It in, uh, encourages aggressive gameplay in a game where you don't want to put yourself in harm's way. It says, "Now nah, get in there, motherfucker." Well, well, even even the fact that you can get a shield as an item. And it makes you can fun equip of it. it and it doesn't do really anything for you. The shield says this is for like a lame ass weak people from another game. It says something it does not not verbatim, but I remember I played Bloodborne before Elden Ring for a very short period and I tried to kill every single thing in the game that I saw. Because as somebody who had never played a from software game, I just thought that's what you do. This game's hard, yeah, but I'm gonna kill it all. And Bloodborne kicked my ass. It wasn't until <laughs> yeah. I got Elden Ring and went back to Bloodborne where I was like, I can just run away. Yeah. You don't have I can to fight be, everything. I can be like a shadow in the night. I don't have to fight these little fuckers. Sometimes. Sometimes. There yes. are mandatory rooms you must enter and mm-hmm. beat this boss to go further. Well, yeah, bosses. But like the little zombie villager guys that just moan and follow you around. Yeah. yeah. The, although I did make the mistake once of running by them all and then getting to a point where like they could catch up to me. Yeah. And they did. You were just dragging. And I them. was like, fuck. <laughs> yeah. And Gascoigne, that's the true, what they call the, um, the gateway, the gatekeeper boss that most souls games have. He's the market. He's market. Yeah. Yep. He is 
the true test of do you understand what this game is? Yep. And it's it's truly just like, all right, do you think you're good enough? Are you sure? Are you sure? Like, even in Armored Core 6, there's one boss. I think I actually think they nerfed it in a recent patch. So I guess I get a gold star for uh, being able to, to defeat it. Baltius is okay. the name of it. And if you watch videos of it, it's just missiles galore, man. That thing fucks you up. I'm curious to see if I go back to it, if I'm any better. Okay. But, you know, there's a... What's the what's the gateway in well the gateway in Bloodborne would be Gascoigne. Dark Souls one, the gateway boss is probably not the tutorial boss. No, but there there's kind of a gateway boss in the form of the Taurus demon. Yes. That's as far as I got in Dark Souls One uh remastered. But yeah. you can cheese it off the the ledge. That's I always it, do it. Yeah. I stagger it and then I just push it. <laughs> right. And then there's uh, Ornstein and Smo. That's another big one. That's a that's like one of the that's like a hey, welcome to the last quarter of the game. If you can beat this, it's really hi, it's welcome really and fuck you, fuck you hard. I'm impressed with uh, your brother though beating him. Yeah, one through three. Yeah, shout out to Judge Tempest. Dark Souls three came out in 2016. He was director of that game. Miyazaki wanted this to mark the end of the series. One of his first decisions as company president was saying their most successful franchise is done with this next game. He's like, now nah, we're done with Dark Souls. This is the last one. The The ending of Dark Souls 3 is pretty much like, yeah, I think we have no ideas left. Yeah, yeah. but also having a plan and just like, all right, this is what we're fucking doing. We're doing it is commendable. I like that. If some, if, you know, um, they said Mass Effect 3 is our final Mass Effect game. We're going big, and then we're doing something new. I'd appreciate that. Yeah. Instead of, this franchise has tits, and we're going to, like, fucking milk that sucker. Yeah. Till they're run ragged. And that cow is <laughs> crying and dying, and they're like, you're going to give me another cup of milk. And that's not what they, I mean, it's just amazing that Miyazaki, one of his first decisions was Dark Souls 3 is the last Dark Souls game. Well, it's, yeah. it's a common thing, not only in video games, but in television, too, where people oftentimes overstay their welcome with a project. You need to go out on top that for legacy, for quality, there is a lot of benefits like breaking bad is another perfect if example. Breaking bad was eight seasons. It, it would not be as good. Diminished. You need to recognize when the story hits a natural end, when you have the most fever pitch for it and then exit gracefully. Cause then you leave such a good taste in your, your fans mouths and you want them wanting more yeah yeah and it's I, okay to want more when the project's gone just produce quality while you're there and it will be appreciated for longer i think lost what, i think what's i think what the Pe show oh yes i was like what yeah <laughs> i think what people in these positions get really afraid of is they're afraid of losing like ip style brand recognition because you can make like this is exactly what happened with like Elden Ring. You can base Elden Ring might as well be Dark Souls Four. It just got a new name. It might as well be the same fucking thing. It plays almost exactly the same. It's very different though, too. It's a whole different approach to a to a lot of but similar this, concepts. This, but yeah, but the style, like their Souls born style, and is Bloodborne pretty, could have been called like, Demon Souls Two, and could Sekiro have. could have been called what is it, Tenchu Two? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it could it, have been anything, but choosing to choosing to go the opposite route and being like, well, it, there's nothing recognizable about the story in Dark Souls too much in Elden Ring. There's still like the fantasy tropes that you find. But play, after playing through all three of Dark Souls, you're just like, oh, OK, well, this is the world. It's closed. The loop is done. Let's I think get it's over with it. I think it's uh valuable to temper expectations yeah. too because elden ring is not dark souls no. elden ring is no it's not more for the masses it's more approachable much it's more approachable. much more forgiving it is way more forgiving yep and it's there to be challenging if you want to challenge yourself and it's there to be a little nicer if you want help yeah uh and overly long uh yeah <laughs> but Dark Souls 3, uh, Bloodborne's limitations wanted him to return to the Dark Souls series. Level design was created to become more of another enemy the player must face. Yeah. Vague story. New weapon arts were inspired by Guts from Berserk. Yeah. Hey when describing how great sword combat is changing and the speedy archery of Legolas from the Lord of the Rings films. Archery still sucks in Dark Souls 3. <laughs> Said he was inspired by Legolas, though. 
Okay, well. I mean, when you see him do that cool move in Fellowship where he stabs the the orc in the eye with the arrow and then he pulls it out and strings the bow and shoots the one directly behind him, Ima- how can you not be inspired? Imagine punching an arrow through someone's head, though. That's not going to work. No. But it, it does look cool. Yeah, but. With great dexterity. Like, let's comes great responsibility. He just, ro- he just, he made a dex saving throw. I, mean, I don't know if I have, if I'm like an elf who's what, he's like 100. Like he's like a thousand like or something, he's, right? He's old. Yeah, he's like a he's thousand. Like a thousand. Is. Aragorn's like 150. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, so he's like a thousand. I, I imagine you can become John Wick if you really tried. That's true. <laughs> I wonder how many shields he rode downstairs before he stopped falling. Oh, I imagine that. He, if if John just, Wick took a shield and went down the stairs on it, I would believe every second, and he would shoot 10 guys in the way down. But John Wick wouldn't just ride it down. He'd fucking nolly flip that into a 50-50 he'd, he'd board do, slide. He'd, he'd kick flip down. <laughs> just fucking... <laughs> the dumbest shit I've ever heard, and he would do it yeah. <laughs> while using nunchucks. That's funny. Have you guys seen John Wick Four? It's the best. Yeah, I would say the best John Wick because film. there's a whole sequence where he's going upstairs <laughs> <laughs> twice. Yes, <laughs> and that's a famous staircase too. Yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah, that's <laughs> because I'm like, he wouldn't go downstairs. That man climbs. Yeah, he reaches for the top. After Dark Souls Three, <laughs> uh, Miyazaki. Released a game nobody talks about, nobody really knows, called Darasane. Came out in 2018. It's a VR game for PSVR. It's a choice. A title rife with experimentation and novel ideas. He says, I believe, uh, he says, I think death is a crucial element when when designing games. Around them, around them, uh, the theme of satisfaction of overcoming overwhelming odds. Uh, said the title was an opportunity to explore the theme of existence versus non-existence that is only possible through virtual reality. The whole, he's, he described like that, you're in VR and you see a character is looking at you, but you, they also are looking through you because mm-hmm. VR is just not quite there. I want to make a game that will give the player existential dread. That's Yeah, that's most of his games pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Takes place in a secluded Victorian boarding school where six students spend their days with the school's headmaster. You play as a fairy who exists in a separate world that is frozen in time, unseen by humans. On the setting, this was the most interesting thing I found. I've been a longtime fan of Japanese girls manga from back in the days. Not just recent stuff. From way, way back. But I never got to make a game out of it. If I don't do it now, when, I'm, when am I going to be able to have another chance to challenge myself to bring out that secret? He loves shoujo, huh? If whatever that it's might mean, maybe like, I don't. It means what, it means it means girls. It means girls manga, like shoujo manga. There's shonen and shoujo. Okay, uh, and they're all very flowery. They usually involve some sort of either like magical paranormal conceit, or it's just is, straight up drama. Is Elfin Light a girl manga? No, because I love Elfin, me. Elfin, I love me some Elfin Light. Elfin Light is. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce the title. Apparently, it's fine. no, it's okay. Uh, Elfin Light is very. Um, not <laughs> okay it's what you would call seinen which means like like elder it, it 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 is ostensibly for older audiences yeah i mean it's a very mature subject yeah, it's matter it's really scary too so this was his girls manga game that he kind of wanted to make it's about fairies it's still got some dark elements uh yeah. forgotten city they delved too deep into the science of fairies and actually destroyed the city there's a lot of like bigger concepts that he always likes to deal with but it's based on a small story about children he also said he didn't know when he would be able to make this game if ever did he forget he's president but he could literally do it whenever but juggling it between other projects and obligations true yeah that's probably what he meant mixed reviews basically flopped Uh i played some of it and it did not stick with me no no it's fine you know sometimes yeah sometimes you make that weird kind of he just wanted to, I think he just really wanted to fuck around with the VR engine. Yeah. they. I'm sure PlayStation came and said, we're going to give you a lot of money. Yeah. And you could do a smaller team for that. Yeah. 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 He was obsessed with how the, the school was laid out, uh, much like level design, the way you explore it. Makes sense. 2019, Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice. He was director. Uh The whole plot and overall story is his, but left most of the actual writing to the staff. He relinquished a lot of uh, narrative control. Uh, There wasn't much of a story to be told, but quotations. Uh, So when you say Japanese inspired, you can typically go in one of two main directions. One samurai and one's ninja. (laughs) 
The reason we opted to go with Ninja is that Samurai is usually more grounded, more fixed. Their combat is mostly on the ground. Ninjas, at least, as far as a Japanese person is concerned, can do anything and go anywhere with that design. Ninja is fantasy. Ninja is quite fantasy. Because mostly they're spies. Well, and then they also, there's, I haven't played Sekiro. Yeah. Grappling hook? Grappling hook, yeah. Is that what would you Fixed, call it? Yeah, it, it is a it is a uh, it is a grappling hook. Essentially, it's you have a prosthetic arm, and then it can like shoot rope. Essentially, yeah. Uh, I f- I fucking love Sekiro. I fucking love it. I I haven't beaten it, and I it's not because I would have to dig in deep, and I have ADD, <laughs> and there are a lot of the one thing that separates Sekiro from a lot of the other games is that this is so action focused. Mm-hmm. Like you can gain abilities and stuff, but there's no, if you actually face a barrier, you can't cross go fuck yourself. It's essentially learn how to do it or you're done because mm-hmm. your currency, you much like the other games, you get souls or whatever, but you can only spend those to either get, uh, upgrades, weapons, and not stats. That doesn't right. And it doesn't guarantee that, it's going to help you. It might help you in a way, but it's kind of like, you know, different tools for different jobs. And there's ways to cheese bosses, but I won't get into that. Tenchu, uh, quotations, Tenchu was the original inspiration for this game. We originally thought of placing it under the Tenchu series when we began the project, but gave up after that pretty quickly. Tenchu has been created by a very different group of people, and we felt that we wouldn't be able to create it anything but an imitation of Tenchu if we were aiming for it. Yeah. You rank Sekiro pretty high, don't you? It might be my favorite. Above Dark Souls. Yeah. Playability-wise? Yeah. Uh, So when I say that, I'm talking about form and function. Mm -hmm. How, like, I kind of praise how clean a game is. Do you you guys kind of know what I'm saying about that? Cleanliness in a game is kind of like if you break it down to its bare bone bones and course core concepts, is this game like, does it have the same thesis statement all the way through? And Dark Souls can kind of lose the plot a little bit. It can kind of veer off. It can be different. And that's something I love about it as well. But with Sekiro, it you kind of, you understand what you're in for the moment you start the game. And if you don't like it, it's fine. But if you're down to clown, go for it. I need to play Sekiro. It's beautiful. It's honestly like, it's a game that you will appreciate as a Bloodborne, Bloodborne player. Bloodborne. 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 This game is mostly like parrying and deflecting and moving in for kills and getting a few swipes in before dodging and running away. It's really great. So we're not going to jump into Elden Ring until we talk about Martin, which we might not do today. We'll figure out the timing. Uh, we don't want to miss any Packers, correct? Sure. Yes. Or is that okay to miss Packers? I mean, it's okay to miss a little Packers. Okay. As president, um, Miyazaki says he meets other presidents and thinks they are just so weird. He uses them as enemies sometimes. Really? <laughs> yep. I like that. It's just like with their sensibilities. He's just there thinking about... Uh, the Sengoku period of Japan history and how it influences his armor design. And this guy's like, the money in the saw the quarter. He's like, who the fuck are you? Man, I hate tools, dude. In the public. I hate the man. <laughs> in the public. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah, brother. Yeah. Fuck yeah. The man. Fuck the oh, man. man. Yeah. High fives all around. Hi, Barbie. In, in the public eye, <laughs> refuses to p- appear on film. Yep. Will meet fans, but he never likes to talk about his own life. Smart. As, as director, usually writes the majority of the story, dialogue, and text, having the final say, calls himself a micromanager. We've described a lot of what uh, his values are. Yeah. Personal life, he does have a daughter, mm-hmm. and he says he doesn't want to let his family play his games because I feel like they, they'll see a bad part of him that's almost unsavory. I don't know. I feel embarrassed. So I say no Dark Souls in my house. That kind of rules. <laughs> There's nothing better than if an I heard, artist who is self-loathing. Well, imagine if my dad listened to Hair of the Dog Cast, I'd be like, oh, God. My mom has listened. She's my mom like, I don't understand listen. it. Your mom's on Patreon. Yeah. Games that Miyazaki has expressed liking. I just got a list here. Dragon Quest, Legend of Zelda, Kingsfield, Civilization. Hey. Eco, Shadow of the Colossus. Mm-hmm. Breath of the Wild. Yep. Skyrim. Oblivion. Yep. Hearthstone, Uncharted, 
Okay. Left for Dead. Okay. Metal Gear Solid Five. Mm-hmm. Evolve and Magic: The Gathering Online. And mm-hmm. Madden 2021. It's Big, like, why is the, that in there? The lore. It's the lore. It's the lore. Uh, manga he likes. <gasps> Berserk. My favorite. Saint Seiya. Saint Seiya. Seiya. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Yeah. Devilman. Devilman's good. Basilisk. I've never read that one. Record of Lodas War. The Record of Lodas War. Yeah. Okay. And literature he has expressed liking. H.P. Lovecraft. Mm-hmm. Bram Stoker. It's all making sense. And George R. R. Martin. Ooh. Now George R. R. Martin, we won't talk about as much. Yeah. There's a, the literature is a lot, but what we're going to talk about his personal life quite a bit. That was a hell of a segue right there. George R. R. Martin was born George Raymond Martin, September twentieth, nineteen forty eight. That scares the fuck out of me. That that's nineteen forty eight. That is three years after World War Two. Nineteen forty eight, and he has to finish two books. I'm sorry, George, if you're listening. I fucking love you. I just really want to know what happened. That is a long fucking time ago. Uh, he was born in Bayonne, Bayonne, New Jersey, uh, son of a longshoreman. Mother was once a part of a wealthy family that lost it all during the Great Depression. He was reminded of this every day. They were living in the projects, and he would walk by the, the, the dock that they used to own. So he has said that he felt like he was part of a, a bigger family that had a reason to rise again. It's uh, the deposed, you know, Daenerys Targaryen mm-hmm. feeling like I, I deserve, I'm worthy of something better than this. Two sisters, Darlene and Janet family couldn't afford travel or much of anything. So he became a voracious reader. Escapism. Yep. I grew up in South Dakota. I understand. <laughs> Martin, uh, when he was just a kid, Began writing and selling monster stories for pennies to neighborhood children. That's dope. That's pretty badass. How yeah. do you even, like, I wonder how long they were. Yeah. And if he still uses the same naming conventions where you couldn't tell the fucking characters apart. This one's named Greg, and this one's Marion, and this one's Radon. G-R-M. <laughs> he... Yeah, so he was selling these penny stories, penny monster stories to neighborhood children. He had to stop when a mother complained about her children having nightmares about him. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Get it, George. So he was already causing children nightmares when he was a kid. He used to have a lot of pet turtles. And he would write stories about them, their mythical kingdom. When one would die from being a turtle... He would just say that it was a, a big plot from the other turtles, and he would write whole stories around how they, like, fucking Knight of Black Knives, the other turtle. That is heavy metal. This was before the age of 13. Um, at the age of 13, he adopted the confirmation name of Richard. That's when he became George R.R. R. Martin instead of just George R. Martin. I don't know if he was just a big token fan at the time. Maybe he wanted another R. In so his I name. can include my fucking Catholic name. What's your Catholic name? Thomas. What's so your middle I'm name? What, Dylan uh, Patrick Thomas Hoff. Then. What is a Catholic name? Uh, I don't uh, know, when I, you're when you're confirmed into the church, they give you, you another name. They let you choose your name. I went with Rothgar, the Destroyer. Hmm. No, I don't know. I didn't get one. You got confirmed into the Catholic Church, but I didn't night. get another name. Oh, they. Mine is like German Catholic. It might be a different thing, okay. but mine might be more Holy Roman based. You're supposed to gain. So that's like how, that's how like people ascend to like the papacy and shit like that. So no shit. I didn't know that. Yeah. So that's when he became George R.R. R. Martin. He went to a heavily Catholic school. He said that he is a huge fan of comic books. He has credited Stan Lee as one of his major influences in quotations. He may, writes better though. In quotations, <laughs> maybe Stan Lee is the greatest literary influence on me, even more than Shakespeare or Tolkien. George R. R. Martin attended the first Comic Con in New York City in 1964. He used to write into the uh, so like there was like the Marvel like newsletter at the end of each issue. Yep, and they would print shit. And he's published in like one issue of the Fantastic Four. It's really cool. Old school. He was oh. yeah. He's been a writer since he was a child. It's really yeah. impressive. Um, in 1970, he earned a. B.S. in journalism with a minor in history from Evanston, Illinois. He objected the draft to the Vietnam War. He applied and did obtain conscientious objector status. Hard to do. Yeah. Um, 
early writing career. At age 21, he started selling short stories officially. We won't talk a ton about like the plots of the, the books or anything, because mm-hmm. that's just a lot to get into. But the first one was The Hero in February 71. A hero of a war wants to go and retire on Earth. Superior officer attempts to convince him otherwise. A fight ensues. Soldier believes he gets his freedom after killing the superior officer, but he is killed on the way out. And it's that's his first published short story, and it became part of what is known as the Thousand Worlds universe. Most of his science fiction stories are all in the same universe because it's fucking giant. You can just get away with it. Mm-hmm. They never have to intersect at all. It's a big galaxy. Kind of a Discworld thing. Uh, 73, he wrote... With Morning Comes Misfall, this short story won his first Hugo Award and Nebula Award. It's a sci-fi about a wraith world where ghostly creatures occupy a mist-covered planet. And there's a, one hotel there where the wraith hunters stay. And someone comes to try and prove whether or not the wraiths are real. And the hotel owner is just like, this would really hurt my business if people knew. <laughs> So they're letting them like fantasy cosplay as uh, like ghost hunters. It's like a big fake thing that the hotel owner is just pushing the myth so people come stay at his hotel. It's just Hotel rolls. California. I don't know enough. That's about not that a song. myth though, and that's also a metaphor about drug use and death. Kinda, but death from drug use. Yeah. Yeah. Tomato, tomato. You can check tomato out any time you like, but you like, but you can never leave. Yeah, you never really quit smoking. You're just in between cigarettes. Man. That's not true. I'm not in between cigarettes. So far. Maybe. (laughs) He worked as a tournament director because he wasn't making enough money selling his stories. So he worked as a tournament director for the Continental Chess Association and became an English and journalism teacher from 1976 to 1978. In 75, he married Gail Burnick. They had five cats. Nice. Lived in Dubuque, Iowa. Hated the Winters, credited Dubuque, Iowa with one of the inspirations for the Winters in Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And he had to get a day job partially because his wife was going back to school. So he had to support. 1977, his first novel is released called Dying of the Light, uh, sci-fi. Dirk Talarian leads a joyless and lonely life until one day his ex-girlfriend, Gwen Delvano, calls him on an expedition to the dying planet of Warlorn. Soon he becomes tangled up in Gwen's mess of a life and is persuaded to save her from the misogynist traditions of her new partner's culture. In trying to pull her from the old traditions of John Vicari's Cavalar world, Dirk finds himself facing problems that are a lot bigger than simply reconnecting with an old flame. That sounds dumb. (laughs) It's really weird when you realize that Dirk went on to become Dirk Diggler and the sequel Boogie Nights. Mm -hmm. Totally packing. Yeah, that's odd. That was a weird stylistic choice they took there. George R. R. Martin has always just unabashedly had some of the most fantasy sci-fi names in his shit, too. Well, it's you know what's funniest about it is that when you even talk about like Frank Herbert, who wrote like Dune, a lot of these, a lot of these, <laughs> sorry, but I think he would acknowledge himself as a dork, probably an era specific dork. They're all horny as balls. <laughs> They're all so horny. <laughs> and I bet there's so much sex in this book. Cause like Frank Herbert, like all he does is talk about like supple young breasts and shit. And it's like, yeah. and it's, they're horny as fuck. Like, I mean, I get it. It's a part of life, but it's also just like, I don't know. I mean, if there can it's be not what I'm buying, <laughs> I think that it's healthy to have uh, oh, yeah. graphic depictions of sex. Well, I mean, horn up. Uh, it, Cause if death is okay, if yeah. stabbing's okay, stabbing should also be okay. Hey, I see what you did there. I and uh, yeah, I I always think about that whenever like puritanical ideas get involved. Yeah, and Martin just always was heavily involved in the community. Uh, always liked doing short stories with other writers or helping each other to succeed. While he was never hugely successful for most of his career, he was always writing and always helping other writers, like trying to lift each other up. He was the one who started the Losers Party for the, I think it was the Hugo Awards or the Nebula. Uh, his hotel room was just where all the losers could hang out after they lost and they would, the winner would show up and they'd make fun of them. Oh, that's fun. Which is great. Uh, that's good sportsmanship. And also it kind of shows that he's a true artist at heart. It's like, it's not about, it's not about what you get from other people. It's about what you get from yourself. It's true. And he has said, uh, once he started going to the sci-fi conventions or like the, you know, the, the, the writing conventions, he's like, 
There's a lot of women that like sci-fi. <laughs> Dude was thriving. <laughs> he was doing well. Uh, Dying of the Light, he sold the novel for the same amount of money he would make in three years of teaching. Wow. That's a W. That's a W. That's a big, fat dub. Mm -hmm. In 1979, a friend passed away, and he felt like he needed to become a full-time writer. He moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico, divorced with his wife, Gail. He met his longtime partner, Paris McBride, in 1981. And he finally married her in 2011. But he did live alone for three years in Santa Fe. He described it as one of his most tremendously productive uh, times for writing. I mean, as an indoor person with no friends, I think you'd do pretty good. Yeah. What else are you going to do? Yeah. I mean, I played all the Dark Souls games. <laughs> 1981, he wrote Windhaven with Lisa Tuttle, a former romantic partner. He has described the, the man she was seeing at the time as a horrible person. Who inspired Lisa Turtle on um, uh, Saved by the Bell. Saved by the Bell, yeah. Yes. Uh, the turtle that he found most attractive. Yes. Yep. Raphael. Uh, until the evil Screech showed up <laughs> and tormented her. No, he's, he's Screech. He's Screech. Yeah. Before Screech got weird and got stuck mm -hmm. in a town in Wisconsin uh, because he assaulted uh, somebody. I'm sorry. It, it, I'm sorry. Are you talking about Chilton that way? Chilton? Is that, is that the, where is it was? The town? Yeah. Oh. You're the Wisconsin historian. I knew, I knew people who knew Dustin Diamond. I yeah. were there the day that he stabbed. Great man. <sighs> you know. But he wrote Windhaven with a former romantic partner. These are three novellas all taking place on the fictional planet of Windhaven. Inhabitants are descendants of human space voyagers who crash landed on Windhaven centuries before the book takes place. A caste system has evolved for those that fly gliders between the pockets of civilization. The world building has consistently been one of the most interesting parts of Martin's writings, mm -hmm. like even the Dirk Teleri in Dying of the Light. The whole concept is there is a planet that has like 13 years before it gets too close to one of its suns that it like blows up. So all these civilizations make the coolest spot that is designed to be there for 13 years as like this big like party central, like joyous. It's like the world's fair kind of for sure. outer space. They know it's going to end. So it's like a, we have this one period. No cleanup, baby. And it's, it's like a giant macabre. It's like a cool concept. Yeah. And the concept of, you know, this planet where... There's these pockets of civilization that you have to use these specific gliders. And then the people that can fly them, all right, well, we are in charge now because you can't do anything without us. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's world building that one of the, it was one of Martin's uh, strongest elements, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I saw a interview he did where he talked about world building and how lost in the weeds you can get with it. Cause you start on one tangent, like uh, what do these people do in their daily life? And by the end of it, well, they go to church. So what's the religion? Who are the gods? And before you know right. it, you're talking about cosmic entities and how they've shaped the universe. And it's, it's crazy how his mind just continuously expands a, upon such little ideas as someone as someone who writes a lot of i do actually write quite a bit of like sci-fi related stuff uh script wise because i keep trying to find that golden little nugget that lets me make a comic book at some point uh you worried about getting too caught in things and you worry about saying things too quickly you got to do a slow build into all of this that's actually one of the things i can say he does really well in game of thrones like you kind of get the ideas like, oh, these people are in charge. These people are also in charge and they're all going to meet up for this big thing. And and these people hate those people because of something that happened 100 years ago. Yep. And they briefly mentioned this one street, which is in influenced by this one previous historic exactly. event. And it's and you kind of get the grasp of like I, I've called it Lore Bukaki before and I've stolen that from somewhere. I don't remember. Henry where. Gilbert. Henry Gilbert. Maybe. We've talked about Lore Bukaki before and you seem like you were referencing... Um, What's the name of their podcast? Last podcast? No, not not Henry, Henry Gilbert. Hen not Henry Zabrowski, Henry Gilbert. Oh, no, I think I got it from even Video Game Apocalypse. Yeah, Henry Gilbert's on there. No, not anymore. No, not okay. Not for a long time. Okay. Uh, but Video Game Apocalypse. Chris, where, Chris Antista. Uh, I Chris believe Antista. it was him okay. describing uh, getting into The Witcher 3. And oh, yeah. Not, just really not knowing. Like, it's just like, I can't learn all that. He's just like, I'm too old to learn all this shit. I can't do it anymore. Because they just spray your face with it. Yeah. And I just took it head on, you know? 
you just really got to embrace it. Hey, man, point. when you're when you're depressed, you, you've got a lot of patience for a lot of bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. And it's and it's not out of like sincerity. It's literally just like this is what I deserve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts because it's true. <laughs> hey, man, I've been there. I still like I, I was a little depressed when I like because I quit Starfield for like three days. And I'm just like, Dylan, no, you got to give it a chance. You really got to go back at it. And then I was just like, just pretend you're living in the world. Just pretend like you're just this idiot with amnesia. And then you have everyone explain shit to you. Just let it flow over you. And now I, I can, I'm pretty well versed in that lore. I get it. Hell yeah. I get how it works. But you got to really immerse yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Get and immersion you. is important in world building. In 1982, Miyazaki released Fever Dream, which Miyazaki has said is it's his favorite work of George R.R. R. Martin's. It's, I don't know if it's my favorite. It's, it's one of my favorites. That's the graphic novelization, which isn't as good naturally because it's missing all the words, but 19th century Mississippi river steamboat vampire novel. Fucking sign me up. That sounds great. It's insane, dude. It's so good. It's the most Gothic thing since Bram Stoker's Dracula. And it's just the way that he describes feasts in game of Thrones. He describes river boats in this describes all of the rooms and the way that the like so essentially abner marsh is a steamboat captain grappling with financial crisis in 1857 he's contracted by joshua york a rich soft-spoken gentleman they become unlikely business partners when joshua promises to finance the construction of the most magnificent new riverboat uh, better than anyone ever made abner quickly discovers the guests on this boat though are not who they seem to be bum 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 Vampires, Bloodmasters. The shit's awesome, dude. The it's it's just so gothic, and I can see why Miyazaki read it, and it's he became obsessed with Martin. It's when you got like it's tone when you have a nice location that's different than your normal standard. This is where the movie takes place, sort of trope. You know, a steamboat is not your go to like location for a story and then you add vampires to it it's subverting expectations in a way that david benoff and db weiss just could never do just do new orleans riverboats and vampires interesting setup cool antagonist throw them together together with a good writer and you got something really eclectic it's very good i'm, I'm looking over this uh graphic novel right now pretty, and pretty horny it's it's pretty horny uh i actually like there's a part of me that's like this would look better if they took out the color the colorist is not very good. Yeah, kind of garish. It's a little garish. It would look beautiful as just black and white, but that doesn't sell. So so George R. R. Martin, after Fever Dream, thought that he had his big ticket that was going to be the novel. It's called The Armageddon Rag. came out in 1983. That one's right there. Mm -hmm. It is my least favorite, and that's me being generous and saying I did not like that book at all. <laughs> uh, essentially, Armageddon Rag? Essentially destroyed his career at the time. Considered moving into real estate, it went so bad. Holy shit. Frustrated hippie Sandy Blair becomes involved in the investigation of the brutal murder of rock promoter Jamie Lynch, whose heart was torn from his body in a cult-like ritual. Lynch had several bands, including the legendary rock group The Nazgul. Mm -hmm. Hey, I've heard that somewhere before. The lead singer was killed 10 years ago, and Subdued wants to bring in a new frontman who is a plant that wants to have a performance that will unleash a dark supernatural power upon the world. This sounds cool. I I mean, on the surface, but Brad's making a face. It, it sounds okay. I mean, I, the fact that the name of the band is the Nazgul, I'm like, I don't know. Like, yeah, it's a little... That's like kind of... Call them the, de the Death Cunts or something. Like, yeah, yeah, something heavy metal. Yeah. The Death Cunts. I like that. It's not bad. Yeah. There's uh, uh It's cool. The uh, chapters are punctuated at the at the beginning with lyrics from various bands of the late 60s and when, 70s. When I read this, I played those songs before I read the chapter, so I listened to the song that was setting, like, the, the, the how the chapter would feel. Is it a lot of Sabbath? No, no. it's just a lot of, like, yeah, hippie. There's, hippie Hendri music. there's Hendrix. It's the psychedelic era, uh, so there's a lot of Beatles in here, it seems. Yeah, I guess I missed the hippie part. But this did go, this went horribly for Martin. Uh, 86, Tough Voyaging came out. He couldn't get a novel deal, so he did a short story collection, Darkly Comic Meditation on Environmentalism and Absolute Power. Wild Cards started in 1987. 
A Song of Ice and Fire fans hate wild cards. Why? Because George R. R. Martin does what he wants, and he publishes these wild cards books for other art, uh, other authors. It's a sh- like universe oh. other people write in. And every time that they want updates on Winds of Winter, he's like, well, we got two new wild cards books, bitches. And I'm not, I mean, you do you. But it's a science fiction superhero anthology series set in a shared universe, edited by George, sometimes written by him. Alternate history of the Earth after World War II, where an alien virus rewrites human DNA, X-Men. Mm, yeah. Well, uh, no. Well, they, no, not like uh, it's their version of the X Men. Everyone has their uh, different powers. Okay. Well, yeah. That that. Yeah. Ninety percent of humans were killed. Nine percent became Jokers, deformed creatures. One percent gained superpowers, the Aces, and some Aces have useless or ridiculous superpowers called Deuces. Yeah. I. Uh, this is actually a fun concept to me because I actually uh, I wrote a pitch to Marvel when I was twenty and I was really depressed. About uh, a man, a man who who crafts lead. <laughs> oh, gee. and that's his only power. The porcelain destroyer. And so he becomes a really obese guy because, like, the lead industry it's, it was really bad. So he would be a deuce in this universe. Oh, a real deuce yeah. because dropping it, lead deuces. <laughs> He's but it's also got- like uh, they they would call him like the human Faraday cage. He was immune to like solar radiation. Yeah, because he's essentially just a walking vat he's of a lo- lead poisoning. Le- but he can't get he can't get lead poisoning. Yeah, that's wild. So he's just like a, he's like a. Ad. They make him. They make him like in my story. They make him like an a- like the, he's trying to become like an astronaut proper because he's immune to most solar radiation. It's actually a All dope idea. He, it sounds pretty good. He's a lead dispenser. He's a he's a lead Pez dispenser, but it comes out the other end. His superhero name is Ticonderoga. So, <laughs> uh, named P. P- Holly, P- Hollywood <laughs> Hollywood comes knocking. A producer, Philip Daguerre Jr., sought out Martin to adapt Armageddon Rag. That fell through, but Daguerre became producer for the Twilight Zone revival, and Martin was offered to write some of the episodes. Oh, he, this was the '90s revival. Eight, uh, mid-80s. Oh, gross. But he found that working for TV made a lot more money, so he's, he's like, all right, well, I'll fucking just write for TV then. I don't care. Uh, it's a couple episodes. Uh, the Last Defender of Camelot came out in 86 in April. Sir Lancelot and Merlin are immortal and living in modern times due to magic, <sighs> but it's just Merlin fucking around. Double switch. It wasn't Merlin fucking around, and they are in modern times. Uh, Merlin is defeated. Kings are irrelevant. The Once and Future King, I like this story, September 86, an Elvis impersonator has his manager explain she knew the real Elvis who said he was a fake back in the day. So this somehow, this guy somehow travels back in time to meet the real Elvis before the first song is recorded, and the impersonator kills Elvis and becomes the real Elvis. This is the prequel to 3,000 Miles to Graceland. I've never seen it. Is it about an Elvis impersonator becoming Elvis, the real Elvis? No, it's Elvis impersonators who like rob... Uh, they do a stick up. It's a revenge fucking murder fest at the end. Well, See, I'm thinking. I think more, it's got Kevin Costner. Well, this is in about it. an impersonator becoming the real one. I'm thinking more or less about Bubba Hotep. Bubba Hotep. Have you ever seen Bubba Hotep? No, but I hear that's what's in the case in Pulp Fiction. The the Elvis costume from Bubba Hotep is one of the theories. Really? Yeah, okay, that's a stupid so, theory, but so Bubba Hotep is about. Um, it's two. It's uh, it's Elvis. He went into hiding and he let another person take over. And it's him in a nursing home when he's much older and he's trying to convince everyone at this nursing home that he's Elvis. This sounds really cool. And there's a black man there who claims he's John F. Kennedy. (laughs) And I'm in. Dude, I am in. Yeah. And then there's this ancient mummy curse that brings Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. There's also a mummy curse? Yeah, there's a mummy curse, and Bruce Campbell plays Elvis. Okay. Popcorn dogs. Yep. You had me, and then you double had me at Bruce Campbell. And then, <laughs> well, at first, I was really into it, and then you said Mummy's Curse, and I couldn't even. I remember how much. that movie made me cry. Should not have made me cry. You had my attention, my curiosity, and now my and my, my now my boner. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. And yeah, the black guy keeps cl- this old black guy. He's like, yeah, and I'm Robert F. Kennedy, or I'm John F. Kennedy. Yeah, I'm one of like, them. Oh man, uh, and that's why no one believes <laughs> Max Headroom. He wrote oh. a story for uh, for an episode, but it was dis- deemed too disturbing and offensive. 
He wrote an episode for the second season called Christmas, but the show got canceled despite his episode getting into pre-production. In 1987, a feature film based on one of his novels called Night Flyers came out. Is it any good? I haven't seen it. It's about a mysterious alien being and a group of scientists being uh, sent out on a space voyage. They are victimized by the ship's malevolent computer. It sounds pretty straightforward like yeah. every other sci-fi horror. He you said, said 1987? Yeah. Said the film was not hugely successful, but it might have saved his career. It's got a 4.3 on IMDb and a 15% on Rotten Tomatoes. Whoa. So in 1989, Beauty and the Beast was a TV show. Mm -hmm. He was co-supervising producer. He wrote 14 of its episodes with Linda Hamilton playing Beauty and Ron Perlman playing the Beast. We briefly talked about this recently, didn't we? Probably, because I was... It's amazing. Yeah. It's it's like a uh, schlocky romance, uh, weird fantasy modernized. It's... Catherine is the Beauty. She's an assistant DA in New York City. And Ron Perlman, the Beast, becomes her guardian in modern New York City. The whole concept is baffling. Look up a picture of Ron Perlman yeah, as the gotta. Beast. I've seen it. There were three seasons. Linda Hamilton left after the second season. They brought in a new beauty for the Beast. Uh, just the Ron Perlman playing the Beast in uh, 1980. Jesus Christ. I know, right? Oh, my God. And I guarantee a lot of... Mm -hmm. uh, women and men were horny as fuck for this show. Yeah, that uh, is the most terrifying cat face beast motherfucker I have seen in a hot minute. And imagine him in modern New York City, like, can I get a slice of pizza or something? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, what's funny about that is that I actually do believe a lot of people, uh, you know, who get like the intense plastic surgery, like yeah. there are people who actually cite this as how they want it to look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. That one dude who yeah. sharpened his teeth and everything. Like the cat lady yeah. who Terrible. looks scary am, now? This is excellent prosthetic makeup. I'm in awe at it. This is going to give me nightmares. Watch some of the highlights of it. I am going to. This some, is terrifying. Some gooey, gooey nightmares for Tyler, our head. In 1994, a sci-fi show called Doorways about a fugitive extraterrestrial trying to escape from interplanetary goons in the FBI came out. Interplanetary goons. Had to get a day job. Um, so, Alf. What a rip off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, they, I think they just made a pilot for the show. It didn't get picked sure. up. I but can only imagine why. Yeah. Trying to write right. the coattails of the X Files, probably. How are you going to top cat Ron Perlman? You uh, never will. You can't. Uh, George R. R. Martin, though, this is when things changed. Mm -hmm. A Song of Ice and Fire was tired of compromising his imagination for TV and film and wanted to write something with no boundaries that could not be filmable. Uh, arguably. E epic fantasy inspired by the War of the Roses, the Accursed Kings, and Ivanhoe. Game of Thrones came out August 1996. And this will be our overarching entire Song of Ice and Fire discussion because the other books, they, they came out shortly afterwards, longer afterwards, longer afterwards, never came out. But... Song of Ice and Fire it started with a vivid idea of a boy seeing a man's beheading and finding dire wolves in the snow. Immediately started making maps and genealogies. When you when you describe Game of Thrones as that, that's your that's your pitch, right? The boy sees a man behead be beheaded and um, then finds dire wolves in the in the forest, whatever. That's more or less like the the tone that he was trying to set. It's, it's uh, what is yeah, it like just, a vertical slice? Of, it's a vertical slice, yes. but it's also like not accurate to what it becomes. But I know the story. So just you describing that story that way makes me a lot more interested to read his older stuff by the way that you described it, because it sounds like garbly gook when you hear a bunch of it in a row. Well, have you read, have you read the books themselves? I've read the majority of the first one. Okay. The books are probably my favorite piece of fiction I've ever read. They're pretty uh, great. I am as obsessed with the world of Ice and Fire as I am with Bloodborne or Elden Ring. It is one of my, you know, yeah. it's the way that you feel about what, you know, Berserk? Berserk, yeah. That's how I feel about the Song of or, Ice and Fire. Or, or One Piece, yeah. Yeah. Uh, hugely into it. Wanted historical fiction, but where the readers wouldn't know the outcome. Uh, started off by subduing magic in favor of battles and political intrigue. It's very much based on interpersonal drama and characters 
based on realism. The magic, though, is always on the fringes. It's a wise choice. Broadened the fantasy fiction genre with adult content. Hard fantasy with emotional and vulnerable characters. One of the things I think is super strong about these books is the way the chapters are broken up. Mm -hmm. Different POVs. They're short stories. These are like just a short a collection of short stories about characters in the same universe which actually rules because to to even have that level of outline to have that like intricate of how things blend together you're still getting a chronological like forwarding of the story but through eyes and like there could have been other perspectives but later on in a chapter another character will be like i remember when that happened and how i felt there and it'll be like oh yeah i fucking remember that too but it was sansa and it's uh it's all perspective you know so yeah. one character sees something some way when you're inside of theon's head mm -hmm. it you can kind of rationalize how they got to their decisions i mean one of my favorite storytelling methods or tropes or whatever the fuck you want to call it uh is the bias narrator that is my f absolute favorite because essentially it's an RPG book then at that point where yeah. you are putting yourself into somebody else's head and you have to believe that their truths are truth mm -hmm. and that they aren't skewed or swayed in any other way. And you haven't gotten to the part where you start reading Cersei chapters and you're like, I am inside of crazy. Yeah, I'm inside <laughs> of crazy. I understand how she is thinking this yeah. bonkers shit. You're inside of the Cersei chapter is her dealing with shame, you know, like. You read her perspective of walking yeah. through the streets. Well, I imagine it goes like, I'm really stressed out about all this stuff. I'm going to fuck my brother about it. It's kind it's of that. A, I mean, you just you really. summed it up, yeah. <laughs> it, I mean, there's a, there's a lot more going on. But I uh, the thing I admire about it is that everyone's kind of an unreliable narrator in their own heads. I we all like are. That. That, that's what I like about it too. Yeah, yeah. It works. The, the it's a the movie The Invitation. You are in an you are in a biased narrator's point of view for the entire film. Yeah. And you really don't know what's true and what's not. And that makes for excellent storytelling. It's and it's the most sublime world building I've experienced in fiction that from what I've read. Sure. Characters mention things in passing in one book and five books later yeah. That is expanded on with two more sentences, and you can um, expound a whole bunch of world about it. Yep. Because uh, cool. you already know the rules. So it's like placing a puzzle piece in. One thing that I think helps with uh, the, the world of Elden Ring, uh, the different religions, the different outer gods, the concepts are in the world of Ice and Fire, too, where he takes real-world religions, animism, you know, Far Eastern concepts, yeah. and... Bends them, takes this, chops this part off, and it'll include something from another religion. But most of his world building is uh, kind of rooted in, oh, there's this co uh, country or this continent we went to. There are giant, like, monkey men, mm -hmm. and there are diseases there that we can't handle. And it's it's uh, kind of um, it's rooted in things that could have been explained or rationalized in the real world. Yeah. And it goes into old gods. It goes into not understanding how things work. Uh, I, I really, like the world of Ice and Fire, this book here, which is just simply world building and talking about the continents you've never been to are fascinating. That part always intrigued me more than what was actually going on. I'm kind of like the person who really likes like the, oh, fuck, there's like something weird going on in the background. That's the shit I get obsessed with. The drunk priest who just is doing the funeral rites that he just kind of goes through never believed in it and actually resurrect someone. He's like, I, I'm still just a drunk dude, but I guess I can resurrect people now. <laughs> yeah. Are we talking about Lady Stoneheart? Thoris of Mir. Oh, okay. could you read the books? I read them a while ago, 2011. Yeah. Lady Stoneheart's exclusion from the show is one of the most heartbreaking elements. It's strange. They could have really brought her back. Strong Belwas. Yeah. Uh, Daenerys I don't remember her or da them. Daenerys Targaryen had uh, a former, uh, slave coliseum fighter just like this giant big like a uh, black dude i think he was like oh i remember him yeah, yeah okay and he had every time he fought somebody he let him cut his belly one time while he was fighting before he killed him and so he's just full of cuts he's just this giant fat yeah. dude that kills everybody and he just slaps his belly all the time and instead of dario fighting marine's champion it was belwas and instead of peeing on the like the guy afterwards 
Uh, the guy made fun of him for not having a dick because Belwas didn't. And he took a big shit and then wiped his ass with the dude's cape. <laughs> and that's just George R. R. Barton, right? That's there. really funny, though. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot missing. Uh, one thing I find, it's the short storytelling is that great. was from Dance of Dragons, right? It's either I think it was Dance of Dragons, okay. yeah. But there's there's one chapter that sticks with me where Bran is in a neglected castle on the wall mm. that they're not at anymore. The the Night's Watch and there's just this tale about a rat king who ser- like broke guest right and served someone's like child to him and was forever cursed to be a rat. And it's just this isolated short story in the middle of the big thing, a whole history of this one building, it's just this mini like horror tale. And it's exemplary of what I think is so strong yeah. is the, the short story nature of all of the chapters. It, Theon's stuff in A Dance with Dragons when Wild. he is in Winterfell and there is um, a mysterious murderer killing everybody. Mm-hmm. No one knows what's going on. And it is the biggest winter outside. The show failed spectacularly in delivering what George R. R. Martin wrote. I think I think the I think they tried as hard as they could, but like the whole idea that George R. R. Martin is more concerned with what characters go through developmentally within their own lives. And he want like the show just really needs these characters to interact because they're on the fucking, they're on the books. They got to get paid. And I can understand kind of. It's, it's just betraying the conceit of what the books were about. Yeah. Well, Uh, the first season does a fabulous job of adapting up through the first three or four. You can start it. You start seeing it go the wrong way when Rob has, a romantic subplot that is not in the books. Yeah. Season three. Uh, uh, even two. In the books, he has a moment of weakness and then sex with a, a camp follower and marries her out of his code of honor, despite having to betray Walter yeah. Frey. And it's not like this forbidden love. It's more like I have to I have to marry her now. And mm-hmm. honor, much like the way Ned Stark is killed for honor, Rob gets killed for honor. Because uh, he was the one most like his father, really. Yeah. So... Yeah, the show happened. George R. R. Martin, meteoric rise. Everyone wants a piece of this fucking guy now. Yeah, he has since then written tons of short stories, tons of world building. Duncan Egg. Duncan Egg is great. Yeah, it's good. I yeah. hope they they they're talking about making that into an HBO show. Duncan Egg. Imagine um, a young Targaryen prince who just runs off and wants to be a poor person, just experience the world, and he finds this hedge knight, a very honorable big dumb dude. Mm-hmm. Who's like, he'll walk in and be like, you know what? You're fucking wrong. And it's like, yo, you are just walking into a scorpion's nest and starting shit, but Dunk doesn't care. And yeah. he accidentally just saves the planet pretty much. He's they're, really cool. Ostensibly, they're almost like comedy pieces. They're so good. They're funny. They're actually legitimately funny. Duncan Egg is great. But he's been only working essentially in the Song of Ice and Fire world for mm-hmm. his writing since then. Personal life, supporter of the Wild Spirit Wolf Sanctuary. He bought a cinema and a coffee house, which they both had been closed in his hometown or where he's living. Completely restored it. Uh, tons of free showings at the theater. Anything that he's yeah. worked on, he'll like have free showings and bring creators there. He's got HBO money, man. He can do anything he yeah. fucking wants. He bought a bookstore and named it Beastly Books after that's Ron cool. Perlman. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> the The theater was one of the only theaters that shown that North Korean film with uh, James Franco and Seth Rogen. The interview. When they, oh, yeah. when they were threatening to blow up the country and all theaters were pulling at cinemas. And he's like, I don't fucking care. We have free speech in this country. I'm going to play it. Oh, damn. So, God damn. That's a real American right there. Hell yeah. Conscientious objector. I'll tell you what, that's the most American fucking thing you can do. Hell yeah, brother. St- stands up for his beliefs. And I appreciate that. You can, by, you can, by being quote unquote patriotic, you can become the most patriotic person in the world. That rules. I love this country sometimes. Huge fan. <laughs> Huge football guy. Big yeah. fan of the New York Jets and the Giants. I bet he's feeling really great right now. Oh, poor poor guy. Well, <laughs> I wanted Rodgers to do good because when the Jets or Giants do good, he says he writes better. So I have another dog in the fight. There is a giant in the Song of Ice and Fire named 1-1 based off of a Giants quarterback that was number 11. That's awesome. 
He has the Three Stooges written in his characters. He makes references to really obscure... There's Muppets. There's a whole series of uh, Tullys that are named after Muppet characters. God. He fucks around with his world building, too. He called Barack Obama the most intelligent president since Jimmy Carter. Still writes on the same IBM computer running MS-DOS and WordStar 4.0. You lose the distractions. It's, it's got what he needs. There's no Internet Explorer on yeah. that. A lot of his writing styles, uh, notes, characters, maps, uh, characters largely drawn from historic parallels, um, famous stories, Shakespeare. Uh -huh. Despite notes and proofreading, some characters' eyes have changed color and a horse had a sex change is the biggest one in the books. He says fan fiction, he's highly opposed to it, views it as copyright infringement and a horrible exercise for new writers when they could be writing their own new things. I totally agree. I 100% disagree. Whoa. I've adamantly I totally disagree. Agree. I some totally of, agree. Some of my, you got to create your own thing. Yeah. Well, no. When sometimes you get stuck, because I do a lot of writing on my own, and I don't really share it anywhere. It's because I never think it's good enough, but we're not going to get into that. When I hit writer's block and there is an, the story I'm trying to get out that I can't get out, I often jump into the world of The Walking Dead, and I will write short stories in that world or The Last of Us, and I find it to be an incredible exercise to have an already fleshed out world where you can just focus on dialogue and character arc. I'd okay. say as long as you're writing new characters in a yeah. built-up mythos. Yeah, that's what I do. And then you I'm, can just change the mythos around it. I mm -hmm. am of the mind that everything comes from the thing before it. And that if you chose to actually do the creative step of creating all your own shit that was maybe inspired by some of that, I think that's a okay because everything comes from something like the zombie genre that wasn't new when the fucking walking dead did it. So, but them creating their own world, their own rules, they didn't have to work. Like it's essentially like, it's like bowling with the bumpers on. Yeah. But also you could yeah, just, but I, I you could never would want. I would never want to bowl with the bumpers. You on. could just have a zombie framework and not have to have it be in The Walking Dead. But it's uh, being a fan of it and almost contributing privately to it is really accomplishing. And you kind of level I mean, your characters up against the ones that already exist. So there's a bar that's been set that requires like actual, like you you need to do the story justice. It's not like you're just fucking around in a playground. I and I and I respect that, and I actually think. Th there is like room for that, especially when it it's comes more to, so an exercise well, than it is like a imagine an actual a, passion. Well, imagine being a TV writer who jumps into say like Modern Family on the fifth season. You have to already know those characters. Yeah, you got to. When hit that's fine, running. it's fine when it's a group endeavor. But I think when you're on your own, I think that you basically have free reign of everything. All creative control is in your hands. It's much like when I draw something. I don't have, I could, I could fuck around in any way I want, but, and sometimes I'll draw a fan art and, but the, but the issue ends up becoming like, I'm not going to tell people that it's mine. Like, oh yeah. The, the issue here is I think he's very personal about the idea that they stick, it sticks to the person. It sticks to the creator, no matter what that actually is. You can make the argument that once art is out in the world, that it belongs to the world now. I don't think that's true because I've read way too much fucking Harry Potter fan fiction that made me want to blow my fucking brains out. So. I know, and I have to fucking live with the fact that My Chemical Romance is the direct inspiration for Fifty Voldemort, Shades of Grey. Voldemort thought Aunt Petunia looked hot. V Voldemort, yeah. Voldemort said, come here, let me slither between your legs. The motorcycle roared between Hagrid's legs. <laughs> His erection... Was larger than you thought. <laughs> he was a half giant for reals. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Martin has said, I think there are two types of writers, the architects and the gardeners. The architects plan everything ahead of time, like an architect building a house. The gardeners dig a hole, drop a seed in it and water it. As the plant comes up and they water it, they don't know how many branches it's going to have. They find out as it grows. Yep. That's a good analogy. I'm that's much all, more of a gardener in manga. Much more of a gardener than an architect. And that's why I think Martin gets himself into trouble why he's been stuck with Winds of Winter. I'm an architect. There is way too many branches at this point, and he he's he's called it the mare and he's not trying to figure out a way to get all of it to come back in. Yeah. Is yeah, it's like headache. when Batman explains time travel to the Flash in the Flash movie with spaghetti. 
That worked though. Yeah. And as far as a new way to describe time travel, somehow they, yeah, they Dylan loved it. The Flash. He told me, he texted me, he's like, this is my favorite <laughs> film of the year. I own it somehow. The <laughs> influences that Martin has cited, H.P. Lovecraft, I don't know a lot of these uh, people, Robert Howard, Robert Heinlein, Eric Frank Russell, Heinlein, Heinlein Andre Norton, Isaac Asimov, Fritz Lieber, Mervyn Peak, and Tolkien. Heinlein is a really good sci-fi writer i heard that tolkien guy's pretty solid too miyazaki i don't know <laughs> uh, miyazaki now we're gonna get to their collaboration this will go pretty quick for the packers tyler oh no worries um miyazaki says i suppose the beginning of this cl- collaboration came from the fact that i'm a huge fan of martin's work i love a song of ice and fire as well as the tough voyaging series however my favorite is fever dream he sees fever dream as a masterpiece among vampire fantasy miyazaki had from software contact martin Fully expecting to be turned down. It's like when I asked out Carly. Uh, Something clicked during the meeting. Uh, Collaboration began. He came to Santa Fe. The actual collaboration began with Martin ever so politely confirming the themes, ideas, video game related aspects and vision for the game. They had open and creative discussions discussing it. Martin uses as a base to create the overarching mythos of the game world itself full of engaging characters and drama, plethora of mystical... Wait, is your name? Is your cat's name Mart? Is your cat's... Is He's your named cat- after George R. R. Martin, yeah. Oh, my God. I'm so dumb. Yeah. No, no you're not dumb, but no, he's named after George R. R. Martin. Well, yeah, I you thought are. Martin... Sometimes people just give, like, a stir, like... My dog's names. name is Frank for no fucking reason. That's Martin... Fine. My cat's name is Goblin, because I said, look at that little fucking goblin. Martin <laughs> Lionel, because my mom loved Lionel Richie... Jaharis, because Jaharis was the conciliator, and Martin brought great calm and peace to my life. Okay. McFly, because he's McFly, he's a dum dum. I slap my head when he does stupid things to say yeah. McFly. Is he a big chicken? Martin Lionel Jaharis McFly. He's not a chicken, though. He has, he's not a coward. No, no, he's violent. And you got Pickles McNulty. Yep, who just fucks shit up. I'm rewatching The Wire, and I did not realize how often McNulty's the fuck like, did I the do? fuck did I do? It's his catchphrase. I know, I love it. So essentially, Martin's role was. To create the base, all of the things that happened before um, the modern point of the game, all of the interrelationships for the the gods, the broth, the bouillon, the bouillon. He created Rikard. He created Ronnie. He mm-hmm. created the- Radagon is Merica, Finkel is Einhorn. He created the, the base for all of the mythos of the world. Mm-hmm. And then for Miyazaki, that's liberating because then... You can take this starting point, and then everything afterwards yeah. is for them to fuck around. And you, you got the best possible guy it. to do it. The like, best world builder. Yeah. And I think it is because he did minor in history. Like, his world building is very grounded in history, and it's prevalent throughout A Song of Ice and Fire and Elden Ring. And it makes it that much more believable because it does kind of mirror or rival our history. As someone who's really bad with names, they could have really just really done up twice over on that. <laughs> I agree. I am in that camp, too. But it, names are deriving from other things. Um, I understand, but they are all G's and R's and M's. Yeah. And I'm sorry, if if your name is Steve, I'm going to forget your name, man. Can I get a Tommy in there or something? You know? if, if there is Amy. Millicent's sister is named Amy. That's so. true. Great. Famously, Amy. That Amy. That Amy. Love her in Pitch Perfect. They call her Fat Amy. Never seen it. I have. I don't know why. Is it play, Is she played by Rebel Wilson? Yeah. And they just literally just go up, walk up to her and call her Fat Amy. Yeah. It's very weird. They can't do that anymore. Uh, uh, now she's in the words of Tyrion me. Lannister. Uh, wear it as armor. You know. <laughs> you got to know who you are, and if they can't hurt you with it. So when people call me like Big Dick Brad, I'm not offended. That's like, why B Rabbit. You're not was offended because it's nowhere near the truth. That's why B Rabbit <laughs> was able to get on stage and dis. Uh, the entire whatever the group was in Eight Mile. Does he disses himself instead of dissing the other guy? See how they flipped the script there? That's subverting mm-hmm. expectations. Something M&M. D.B. Weiss and David Benoff could yeah. do. Uh, that, so Martin's role was largely just creating the mythos, the, the world building. The player will be able to discover and learn about Martin's mythology through exploration. We are known for allowing the player to explore the game's story and lore through fragments of environmental storytelling. This time around, Martin's story is that you will is what you'll be trying to unravel the period the player explores is still connected to the old times you will gradually discover why the world turned the way it is but 
even Martin has said on, like, I think it was Colbert, I essentially wrote 5,000 years before the game. Everything that happened before then. Yeah. And then it was after the shattering, like, the, the events of the shattering happened. But timeline of production, November 2016, Alika reveals a new soul game is being created where you ride a horse and is written by a very big name. Sometimes the game is referred to as Great Rune. In March of 2017, Martin's assistant, Ty Frank, said that they're working with From Software. Early 2017, development officially had begun. Two weeks before 2019 E3, Martin wrote in his Nada blog he was doing a collaboration with a video game company from Japan. Uh, June 9th of 2019, reveal in a trailer. May 2020, game development completed. July 2020 was when voice recording was happening. These are just what we know because I didn't say, say any of these things to us. Sure. Months leading up to release, Miyazaki leaves the office only sporadically to shower because Uh-oh. Lan- Crunch. if that's his choice, yeah, uh, it if is. he's not making other people do it, I can respect it. No, that's fine. Creative- his daughters are like, I don't know, I've never even played any of this shit. What's he actually doing? <laughs> <laughs> what is a Dark Soul? Quotations, creating a more open game is significant a significant is a significant difficulty for us. If we were to include towns on top of that, it would become a bit too much. We decided to make an open world game focused on what we are best at. And describing the theme of Elden Ring in one interview is kind of the overarching idea. The theme is the will or ambition of humanity. Drip. That's Dark Souls as well. Yep. And the the entire point of the ending of Elden Ring is choosing what you think the best path for humanity is in like an existential world where everything's fucked and gods are not helping us. That's why I keep saying that Elden Ring is essentially a spiritual successor to Dark Souls. You see, where Bloodborne, I became a squid baby who can go to outer space. Yeah, I did too. I fought I fought the thing that's living behind the moon. It's on my leg. <laughs> it's on my leg. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, uh, any closing thoughts on Miyazaki or Martin from you two? I'm excited to play the other Souls games or anything that From Software has From Software done since delving into Elden Ring. But I think that this was a match made in heaven for backstory, history to a game, mm-hmm. and the scope of what Elden Ring was trying to achieve. You couldn't have had a better person lay out the history to have a really good game designer build upon it. It's just It just works really well. I I can't see where Miyazaki goes next. I believe Elden Ring 2 is a possibility, but I also... I just, hope they don't. I'm just more excited to see what Miyazaki does after this because... Mm. Yeah, I generally hope that it's not another Elden Ring. Well, we know for sure it's the DLC. I have a feeling the DLC is going to be massive. I have a feeling it's going to be essentially Elden Ring 2. It's going to be 30 hours of gameplay is my prediction. Sure, yeah. That's essentially what uh, Artorius of the Abyss was for... Uh, Dark Souls and kind of uh, the Hunter's Dream, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the Hunter's Dream, the Nightmare. I forget what it was called. I the Bloodborne DLC, of course. But yeah, I love Martin and I love Miyazaki. And it Elden Ring makes more sense to me knowing kind of who these guys are yeah. and why the design choices were made and how the they built the world. But. Air the Dogcast and Elden Dogs exist because of people like you. So thanks for listening. If you have questions or thoughts about this episode, uh, reach out to us. We'd love to talk with you about them. We are on Instagram. We are on Facebook. We are on Twitter. We don't have a TikTok. Sounds exhausting. I mean, I do, but it's so embarrassing. (laughs) Um, If you want access to these episodes way in advance and bonus podcasts, movie and TV discussions, Raw Dogs, there's a lot of things on our behind the Patreon wall. Mm-hmm. We have a free trial where you can get access to most of it. Patreon.com slash Hair the Dogcast. Special thanks to executive producers, Rykard, Chrissy Nick, Malakip the Black Blade, Blaggard Big Brian, Jordan Hoslow, Sorceress of Blood, and Festering Fingerprint Phil. We love you all. I didn't even know my wife had the uh, nickname. That's great. For Elden Dogs, yeah. Yeah, lovely. I'll have to tell her about that. Yeah. And go pack go. Go pack go. Mm. And Jets and Giants, if Martin is listening. I'll I'll allow it until the playoffs. But I don't think the Giants are going to the playoffs anyway. See, like, Martin wrote all of Aaron Rodgers' career before this year. And then Rodgers... Why do you make him such a prick? Well, I mean, no, it's... (laughs) 
Joffrey was such a prick and one of the most interesting characters in the books. There's a big... Yeah, but I mean... Uh, it's, it's Joffrey's not a good... Uh, if you're a 40-year-old prick, it's different than being a 15-year-old prick. There's a big joke in a marketing campaign right now that the NFL is not scripted. Because they're like, <laughs> you can't script this. So they have commercials where it's like they're doing writers' meetings and stuff. Oh. And with but, Aaron Rodgers... It, it is scripted. I mean, that to a degree, feelings. it's kind of got to be. Well, they, they, they like narratives for like yeah. 7 p.m. games, you know. They want the world to watch because they're like... Are you kidding me? Is it really like fucking wwf it's not that scripted no. but they definitely would prefer certain penalties penalties to be called at certain times for certain teams to make it further and i 100 percent there i if we're looking at scripted the nba is far more egregious with oh yeah the way that it is scripted. see all this shit sounds such horseshit look up the lakers versus the sacramento kings and the early 2000s late 90s is the penalties that got called on sacramento because they wanted la to go to the finals is insane i mean it's just blatant so why even like this? Because football is not basketball. It's still scripted. Ish. But Aaron Rodgers getting a fucking Achilles tendon ripped. Was ish. not on my bingo card. No. Only on one person's bingo card, that Twitter user. We're going to go. Okay. We love you all. See ya. <laughs>